I'm Dee Dee West, and today my friend Summer's back with us. Hi, everybody! Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Linda Lovelace. Wait, before I go on to that, I know I've been gone for a really long time, but I got married, and now I'm back. I'm back into the married woman. And now we're going to talk about Linda Lovelace. Um, So Linda Lovelace was an American pornographic actress who rose to fame within the introduction of the Golden Age of Porn which was a 15-year period from 1969 to 1984. And this was when sexually explicit films got a lot of positive attention and kind of came to the mainstream where all kinds of normal celebrities like Jay Leno, for example, were open to talking about them. We're going to be talking about the 70s, and this era is also about the onset of the sexual revolution and the rise of feminism. So one of the first films of this type was Blue Movie. It's also known as Fuck, and it was written and produced by Andy Warhol. Blue Movie helped inaugurate the porno chic phenomenon, which was essentially, like I said, porn being discussed in public by um, a lot of celebrities like Johnny Carson, and it was even taken seriously by film critics like Robert Ebert. So Linda Lovelace was actually born Linda Borman on January 10th, 1949 in the Bronx, New York. Her family grew up in Florida, She describes her childhood as being brought up in an unhappy family. She was the daughter of John Borman, who was a police officer and who was seldom home. And her mother was named Dorothy Borman and was said to be harsh, unloving, and domineering. So when Linda was four years old, her mother started beating her for every little thing. One time when she was only 11, Dorothy sent her to the store for some nasal spray Linda came home with the wrong kind, and Dorothy beat her with a broom and told her that she would have gotten the right one if she didn't have her boys, her mind on boys. Oh. At 11. Right. She was that kind of mom. Just any little thing she did wrong, she was like, well, maybe you shouldn't have been thinking about boys. Oh, my gosh. Which, it just kind of sets the stage for her her whole life, you know? Yeah. So, So, this was her mom. Dorothy was incredibly strict. Linda went to Catholic school growing up, and she actually wanted to be a nun as far as for as long as she knew. A nun. Yeah, she wanted to be a nun. She was a very good student. Um, in fact, in high school, she was elected vice president of her class, and she liked to play basketball. Her friends actually teased her for being kind of a prude as a teenager. She was kind of shy and self conscious, and whenever she did have a boyfriend, she always took it slow. And her friends made fun of her, and they called her Miss Holy Holy. <laughs> <laughs> her only real ambition in life was to get married at 21 and have a big family with a big house. And then so, what happened? <laughs> I know. So, like, from the very beginning, she just had this goal of being, like, a God-loving, like, family type of woman. You know? Right. She just wanted to be... She wanted to be a housewife. Yeah. You know, have a nice little family with a nice house. Unfortunately, by the time she was 21, she wasn't exactly headed in that direction. Although Linda was kind of hesitant to move too quickly, she wasn't a virgin. She had been in relationships, and she actually became pregnant when she was only 20. Dorothy, her mom, actually tricked her into signing papers to give the baby up for adoption. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but um, in the movie Lovelace, which is like a, a fictional telling based on it, they said that um, she... Her mom told her that they were circumcision papers. I'm not sure if that's true, but basically Linda signed something and evidently terminated her parental rights. So did the baby just go to like a random family or did the mom adopt? Yeah, so it was adopted and she never heard about the baby again. She was 20. She was 20, exactly. And like I said, she wanted by 21 to have this like family and stuff. So that wasn't, that was like the first of her autonomy being taken from her. Huh. Well, not, maybe not the first. So at this time, Linda had been working in a boutique, and she was saving up money to open up her own shop. She had picked out a house and had all these big plans. Sadly, the plans would come to a halt when she was involved in a car accident when she was getting onto the highway and another car came skidding sideways over a hill and crashed right into her. And she was injured pretty seriously. Her face had hit the windshield and part of her eye was hanging down. Oh. And her jaw was broken. Oops. And her jaw was broken, and some of her teeth had, like, punctured through her bottom lip. Oh, my God. How old was she then? 20. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was, uh, or maybe 21. It was, it was like, around the same time. So, her steering wheel broke her ribs and lacerated uh. both her spleen and her liver, and it resulted in a leaking intestine and peritonitis. Oh, my gosh. 
So after this, Linda went to stay with her parents in Florida. And although she was now, so now she's 21, but her parents were no less strict. They had a strict 11 p.m. curfew. And if Linda came home even a few minutes late, Dorothy would slap her across the face or beat her with a broomstick. Oh my goodness, this lady. Yeah, her her mom was really harsh and really just cold towards Linda. And Linda's dad, he just barely said anything. Like, he would walk into the room and see Dorothy beating her, and he would just turn around on his heels and leave the room like he didn't see anything. So, he was consenting. Basically, he, I mean, he, you know, you know what they say about remaining neutral mm-hmm. in a time like that? So, as you can imagine, she doesn't have much of a social life because she can't, she has to be home by 11 and she's 21. And her parents were cold and distant, so you can probably imagine that she was a pretty lonely person. Yeah. One day, Linda was sunbathing in her parents' yard, and her friend Betsy called her up and told her that she was coming over to visit. Linda was wearing a bikini, and she was super self-conscious, especially because she had some pretty fresh scars on her on her abdomen from the car accident. Oh. So after Betsy called, she ended up dozing off, like, on a lawn chair, and then when Betsy got there, she had brought a friend with her. This was <laughs> Chuck Trainer. Betsy introduced Chuck as a photographer. He was 27 years old and over six feet tall. He drove a brand new Jaguar, which was super impressive to the girls because like they were 21. They were used to going out with guys who were driving around in their parents' cars. Right. So the girls went inside so that Linda could change. Betsy had been working in Miami as a topless dancer and she told Linda, I told you about Chuck. He's the one who wanted me to be a model. And then she was like, listen, Linda, I can tell he's impressed by you too. Would that interest you? And Linda was like, what kind of modeling? And Betsy was like, oh, it's not nude. Like, I promise. It's just strictly fashion modeling. So Linda was like, yeah, I'd be interested. But the truth was that Linda was basically interested in anything that would get her away from her parents' house. Because remember, she was only there because she was in this car accident. and She kind of had to depend on them, you know? Right. And they were mistreating her and, like, treating her like a child. Right. And, like, before the accident, she, she had a house and, like, all these plans to start her own shop. They just... You know, now she kind of had to look for a new way out. Right. So Linda went to the kitchen and grabbed a beer for her guests, but she didn't drink, so she didn't get one. Uh, in fact, she was told to avoid she was told to avoid alcohol for two years because of her car accident. But Chuck was like, "I mean, I guess there's no reason you can't smoke." And he was talking about <laughs> pot, and Linda was like, "I mean, she had smoked pot like a long time before, but she was really afraid to be smoking in her mom's house." Apparently, her mom tried to turn her into the police one time for smoking pot, and, like, she actually, like, picked up the phone and called and everything, and then Linda's dad actually, like, came over and took the phone and hung it up. Oh, well, I good job, what he did. <laughs> Right, exactly. But you know what I mean? Like, she actually called the cops on her adult daughter. For smoking pot, right? Yeah. Well. But anyway, uh, Linda was terrified to smoke in her house, but Chuck was really smooth and really persuasive, so they ended up smoking the pot, and then Chuck was like, listen... We have to be back in Miami at 2, but why don't you come along for the ride? So Linda was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Get me the fuck out of here. <laughs> Do you know where in Florida she was living? Um, I don't remember exactly where she was living, but Chuck owned a bar in North Miami. And that was, I know that they, like, had to drive a little bit away. Hmm. You know, like, they had to take a, a highway drive. So, I mean, they were all in Florida. Right. Um, but anyway, Chuck owned a bar in North Miami called the Vegas Inn. And he was, like, in a rush to get back to it. So when they got to it, it was, like, a really dark bar. And it had, like, it was that kind of place that had everyday regulars. Like, it didn't look super out of the ordinary at first glance. It was just a dark little bar. And Linda had, like, not gotten out much. So she was like, this is nice. (laughs) It really wasn't. It was, like, a little... (laughs) She was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, she was just happy to get out. (laughs) So, you know, she went home and she remained friends with Chuck. And after a few weeks, Chuck asked her out. And he was super charming and a total gentleman at first. He would drive all the way to her parents' house to see her and he would take her on trips to like buy her something pretty. Mm. And Linda was just not used to that. She had never experienced that before. Right. And he was always opening doors for her. He would light her cigarettes and just like listen to what she had to say. And he was really respectful and he didn't make any sexual advances towards her at first. So she would go to the bar with him and she would watch him just like take care of the bar and count the register and and do his business. 
Eventually, Linda started to get really fed up with her mom's constant rules and her beatings. And one day, Dorothy really let her have it. And Linda decided that she just wasn't going to allow it to happen again. As she should. Right. I mean, it's one thing as a child, but as a grown woman like that. Right. That just is insane to me. And the fact that the mom just thinks that it's okay. Yeah, and not just that, but it's like, but do you not think she can get up and leave? Right. Do you not think she's capable of, like, getting a job and doing something, like, not needing you? you know? Or maybe she didn't care. She wanted her out of there. Who knows? That's Who knows? what it seems like. Um. Anyway, so uh, after this happened, after the, the last time her mom really beat her, Linda became really quiet and moody while she was hanging out with Chuck. And Chuck told her, why don't you just pack up your stuff and move in with me? And she was like, I, I can't think of a good reason not to. But unfortunately, there were a few things that Linda didn't know about Chuck at the time. For one, Chuck had a police record. He had been found guilty of assault and battery and was presently facing charges for smuggling drugs into the country. He was also running a prostitution ring that Linda wouldn't find out about until later. Oh, wow. Red flags. All over the place. (laughs) After Linda left her parents' house, she and Chuck went over to his friend's house, whose name was Worth DeVore. And whenever they went to his house, it meant that they were picking up pot. I keep saying pot, and that's such a 1970s term, but it's because, like, when you read her telling of it, it's pot. She calls it pot. It's not weed, you know. It's <laughs> marijuana. I have a friend who always said, if an adult asks you if you if you smoke marijuana, you should always respond, like, I don't smoke pot. Because <laughs> it sounds like something you never do. Like, I don't do the dope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do any weeds. I don't smoke pot. Anyway, so they went over there, and Linda was really, really emotional because she had never stood up to her parents before. And the whole time, she's just like, I want to call them. I want to talk to them. And Chuck discouraged her, saying, like, they're just going to con you into coming back. So Linda cried, and Chuck lent her a shoulder. And he was gentle, and he was caring, and he told her that he was going to take care of her. And his voice started to soothe her. That night, Linda and Chuck spent the night together at Worth's house, just in case her parents went looking for her at Chuck's place. The two of them had never had sex or spent the night together before, but when Chuck said, let's go to bed, Linda took off her clothes and climbed into bed wearing a bra and panties, and she had never even thought about the idea of having sex with Chuck, because it was just like on a whim that she left to move in with him. Compared to all the drama at home, it seemed like something really easy to do, just have sex with Chuck, you know? Yeah, like, it's kind of like she's going through this moment where she feels free, and she's like, I'm gonna have sex. Exactly. And like I said, like, he was a total gentleman. Like, she was kind of a prude, and she liked to take it slow, and up until now, like, he seemed to really respect that. Right. And in an interview that I watched, she said that it was very, like, platonic. Yeah, I was, I've read in a lot of places that they were friends for, like, a few weeks, and she actually dated somebody else, like, another friend of his or something in the meantime. And, yeah, they just got along really well, and he one day asked her out. Hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's another reason she had, like, never thought about it up until this moment. And also, like she said, he wasn't pushing it. He wasn't making advances. Right. So Linda describes this encounter as nothing very spectacular or emotional or special. Chuck didn't say anything to her during sex until he asked her to suck his dick. That was one thing that Linda had never done, and she was like, no, I can't do that. So then Chuck tried something else. And at the time, Linda didn't understand what it was that he was doing, but he was going down on her. She, oh. That was something like a concept she had never even like heard of before. Oh. So yeah, she got oral sex for the first time, and apparently she wasn't into it, but after a few minutes, he finished, so she just like waited it out. The next morning, Linda called her father, and she told him that she wasn't coming home. Chuck went and bought her new clothes and took her out to parties and stuff. And for Linda, it was really nice just to be able to go out past 11 p.m. without getting smacked across the face. Yeah, for now. So Linda and Chuck would hang out, and they would take care of the bar every day. And when they weren't at the bar, they would just watch TV and smoke pot all day long. Little by little, Linda started to pick up little bits of information about Chuck. She found out by reading the newspaper that he was facing a big criminal trial. He had been caught carrying a bale of marijuana that an airplane had dropped into a field south of Miami. A bale. A bale of marijuana. Like, he was seen picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> Bales are heavy, sir. <laughs> no, it's a. It's not like, I mean, even like a, an ounce 
ounce of weed is like that's a block that's a brick you know <laughs> a bail you know yeah <laughs> so anyway and she, he gave her all kinds of excuses like you know you know what we saw it and i was afraid some kids were gonna find it so oh. i was gonna take it to the police <laughs> but then i got high <laughs> <laughs> so um another fun fact about chuck Chuck had learned how to hypnotize people because he was in the mil- he was in the military. So he had learned tricks in Honduras and in Japan, like um, erotic or I'm sorry, exotic sexual practices. <laughs> Same thing, you know, erotic and exotic practices. Sorry. Orgasm, organism. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he started offering to hypnotize Linda. Like first, it was when she was tired. Like he was like, "Listen, you're always talking about how you didn't get enough sleep." I can hypnotize you for five minutes and make you feel like you've gotten a full night's rest. So she went along with it and like, he was right. Like she really did feel like she was fully rested. And then he offered a hypnotizer to help her quit smoking. And that worked. So again, Chuck was very persuasive. And on the other hand, Linda didn't like to let him down and not because she was afraid of him at this point, but because like, he took care of her, you know? He was her yeah. shoulder. Was so do you off. feel that he actually hypnotized her, or she was just like, I want him to, you know, feel like he uh, did something? You know what? I'm, that's a good question, and we're going to get into that more later, because this isn't the end of his hypnosis. With a lot of this story, so first of all, my source for this is the book Ordeal, which is the third book that Linda wrote. The third? No, I think it's the fourth one. But this was like the tell-all where she talks about how, like, everything in the past that she ever did was basically a character created by Chuck, and none of it was done by her consent. So a lot of people argue that and think that, like, no, she's lying, that that's just her trying to, like, pull out of what she did. Right. Disassociating. And and that's the whole thing with the hypnotism, too. It's like, is it possible? Like, I'm sure it is, but, like, do we know, you know? like Right. But I'm, I'm going to let you decide for yourself when I, when, I explain, when I describe to you those hypnotisms a little more later. Okay. So um, getting back to, you know, he asked her about the oral sex. And a quick trigger warning because this, this, this part's going to get a little bit graphic sexually. Sexually. Chuck continued to ask Linda to take his dick in her mouth. And eventually she tried it, but it was really hard for her to do. I mean, for one, it was something she didn't want to do, so it was hard for her not to gag. And she really wanted to please him, but she just couldn't get into it. It made her really, really uncomfortable. And then Chuck started telling her that this is the only way he could become fully erect. And her no was never quite enough. Like, he wasn't, he wasn't obviously pushy. He was, you know, like, man, that's too bad, because, you know, like, this is the only thing, the only way I can really get pleasure like how oh, i give you pleasure woe is me right so chuck talked linda into letting him hypnotize her and helping her relax her muscles and her gag reflex so that she could give him head and when i say he talked her into it it was more than just convincing her because he would like he was seemingly a nice guy but he would also kind of tease linda and like condescendingly make little comments that would make her feel like a dumb inexperienced little girl like he was constantly trying to get her to suck his dick and he would see he would say things like, Why are you making such a big deal out of it? Everyone does it. Like you're a grown woman, Linda. And then he'd be like, Look, Linda, it all comes down to whether or not you want to make me happy. So these are all like red flags of an abuser. You know? Oh, for she, sure. She doesn't know this, you know? He's like gaslighting her and he's super. Oh yeah, all of it is her, you know, not wanting to be a good girlfriend or partner. Right. You know? Or she's just young and inexperienced, you know? Which just kind of sets her up to fail anytime she rejects a guy, you know? Yeah. It's horrible. It's horrible. Hang on. Hang on a second. Hold on, guys. <laughs> so Linda went along with it. She accepted that this was only temporary. And, and Chuck even told her, you're going to start to like this once you learn how to relax. And I'm actually going to be helping you in the long run. Oh, okay. So long story short, this is how Linda learned what would be known as the deep throat technique. It's basically like an advanced blowjob where you would take the entire penis in your mouth all the way to the back of your throat. It's not particularly easy, especially for people who have zero interest in putting a penis in their mouth. But Chuck essentially hypnotized her and trained her to do it, allegedly. And like I've heard her in interviews talking about how it's like, oh yeah, once you like lean your throat back and open up your esophagus, like you can. It's basically just like how sword swallowers do it. Oh God. Imagine the first time you try to swallow a sword. Like, no thanks. 
And it's not just swallowing it, though. It's taking it in and out and, like, breathing. You know yeah. what I mean? Sucking dick is and, hard enough. <laughs> and in the sword, at least, I'm like, I imagine you're trying to keep it fucking still and straight. And, like, yeah, yeah a penis isn't going to stab you, but, I like, I would be afraid of throwing up on you. Like, what if I accidentally not relax for a second? Or, like, <laughs> not relax. Or, like, I don't know, you brush against me and tickle me or something. I'm just like, oh, you know, and the thing is down my esophagus, like... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tied by asphyxiation. <laughs> asphyxiation. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, Sorry. So, little by little, as Linda continued to find out little pieces of information about Chuck, she noticed that the bar was becoming looser and looser. Like, Chuck gave her the responsibility of bookkeeping, and one night while she was counting at the register, one of the barmaids just took her top off and her bra and started serving the drinks topless and none of the customers like reacted at all so linda just got the idea that like this wasn't the first time doing this but somehow she had never noticed it before so then on nights when chuck and linda were home and getting ready to go back to the bar they would get a call from one of the barmaids telling him not to come yet so linda would be like what was that about and he'd be like oh not much they're just they're dancing naked for some of the regulars and, like, Chuck really enjoyed just, like, casually telling Linda things like this and then just, like, waiting for her reaction. Because she really was, like, easily shocked and a little bit gullible. And he, like, he was fueled by it. Yeah, didn't she go to Catholic school? She did. Exactly. <laughs> so, like, like, oh, my goodness. Right. You can imagine that, like, these are things from, like, her wildest imagination couldn't have come up. Right. She's like, people do that. And, well, and not just that. Maybe she did think people did it, just not that Chuck did you know? Oh, true. Yeah, because he was so gentle, gentle. And he knew yeah. how she was, and he would just like bring this up out of the blue to surprise her. You know, he enjoyed. Like he enjoyed it that way. Value. Yeah, he enjoyed Isn't there doing a it that way. For that, like, it's almost like that's why he sought her out. He preyed upon her because she was gullible. Because he wanted to turn her out. Well, in his what he gets off on is scaring her. Is her fear. You know, right. it's her fear and her panic and her shock. Her reaction. So, like, of course, he needs to find, like, the more, the most innocent thing he can for the biggest shock value. So, um, this one night, they went to the bar, and it was completely dark. Like, from the outside, it looked like all the lights were off. It looked like the place was shut. Uh, the, it looked like the place was closed. But on the inside, it was almost completely dark, and the jukebox was playing. Linda saw this one young barmaid named Roxanne, who was about 17, and she was dancing on the bar completely naked. A man reached up and put a dollar bill into her vagina. Oh. Another barmaid was lying on a table, and a guy was hunched over her and having sex with her, while a second guy had his thing in her mouth, and a third guy was aggressively rubbing her breasts. Oh, okay. So Linda's shocked. Like, this, this really was beyond, like, her wildest imagination. And she also couldn't believe that nobody else was reacting that her and Chuck walked in. Like, she kind of expected them to, like, stop and cover up. But she just, she couldn't fathom that people would do these kinds of acts in front of other people. And, right. like, this was a bar. They're on a table, you know? Gross. And the dollar bill in her vagina? Well, she was, like, 17. That's the part that, I mean, it, it's the 70s. And I, I don't, you know, I imagine that. Not I imagine, you know, that was the era of people figuring out their sexual right. things and a lot of runaways and, like, finding people who allowed them to explore that. But anyway, Linda was not one of these people, you know? <laughs> Linda's 21, and this is, the, like, she's never been exposed to any of this. Other than, like, her friend Betsy. Like, that's the thing. Her friend Betsy was the slutty one, and she made fun of Linda for being the prude, and Betsy was the one that introduced her to Chuck. So it's not like she was a total prude. Like, she's, you know, open-minded right. in the beginning. And I think that's part of it. She didn't want to. She started feeling like a little kid. Right. Know? Yeah. So they were doing it on the table. Yeah, no. So that was that was the end of that. And I Chuck just kind of, like, brushed it off. Like, Linda, chill. You know, like, grow the fuck up. So Linda just kind of, like, well, no, that's not true. I think she actually turned around and tried to walk out. And that's when he was like, grow the fuck up, you know, and she left, but they just, you know, went on with their lives. Huh. So then one day Chuck introduced her to a woman named Teresa saying, she used to work for me. And he was like, oh, at the bar? He was like, no, as a hooker. So this is how she found out that he once ran a house of prostitution. And it, like at the same time, this wasn't like a huge shock now, like as she's learning things about him. Right. 
the bar wasn't doing so well and Chuck was like, well, we could start up that business again and you could just like answer phones and take appointments. But Linda didn't want anything to do with it. But then he told her, Linda, a woman has a product and she should use it. A product. It's just like a, we were watching an interview earlier and she literally says like the, how that's the problem is how men treat women like they're a product or not a person participating. But we'll get to that. As the money situation got worse, so did Chuck's temper. They lost the bar and they traded in the Jaguar for an old Volkswagen. Chuck finally told Linda, not asked, he told her that they were starting the prostitution business back up and that she was going to be a madam whether she liked it or not. Finally, she said, Chuck, don't talk that way. I've been thinking everything over and I think that it's time that I got back up to New York and... And then Chuck struck her on the side of the head before she could finish that sentence. Oh, wow. She fell and things got blurry and he started kicking her while she was lying on the ground. And he was quiet and cold, methodical, until she started screaming. And then he started to get excited. This was the first time that she had ever seen him fully aroused. Oh. Isn't that something? He then raped her on the floor. And when he was done, he said... You're not fucking going anywhere without me. So now she was scared. Wow. The next day, the phone rang, and when she went to pick it up, Chuck grabbed it out of her hand. He answered it, and then he said, It's your fucking mother. Take it on the extension and tell her that you don't want her to call anymore. Wow. So he's, like, totally separating her from her family, too. This is the beginning of it. So Linda was like, I'm not going to say that. But he was like, you're going to do what I say, and I'll be listening to every word. And if you know what's good, kiss mama goodbye now, or you'll get another sample of last night. So she did exactly what he said. And after that, Chuck never let Linda out of his sight. He didn't ask her to do things anymore. He told her. He also started playing with his guns right in front of her, kind of like a future, like a, like a warning. He had a 45 caliber pistol as well as a semi-automatic machine gun. Linda learned to stop expressing her opinions, just keep them to herself. Mm. One day, Chuck was like, we're going for a drive. He didn't tell Linda where they were going, but she was just happy to be in the car for a while where she couldn't get hit. He told her they were just going to go see some people for business. They went to a motel, and they went into a room where they met with five guys who were all dressed like businessmen. They ranged from ages 35 to about 50, 55. The guys were really polite, and they offered her a drink. And at one moment, Linda excused herself to go to the bathroom. And when she came out, the other guys had, like, been in a different part of the room. There was, like, a sep- like a separator. And Chuck was there, and he was like, Linda, those five guys out there, you're going to fuck all five of them. And Linda was like, Chuck, don't talk crazy. And Chuck was like, well, oh, you're going to fucking do it all right. Believe me, you're going to do it. I've promised this then. I've given my word. You tell me you don't want to run my business. I give you every chance in the world, and you tell me no. Okay, you don't want to run it? Then you can be a part of it. Linda kept objecting, and she tried to sound strong and, like, put her foot down, but she realized that Chuck was really crazy now. Chuck pulled his gun out of his pocket, and he said, I'm going to shoot you right now if you don't go out there and do what I'm telling you. You're going to take off your clothes, and you're going to go out there, and you're going to fuck those five guys And if you don't, I'm going to put a bullet into your head right now. So he just, like, straight up pimped her out. Yeah, and she had no idea. He was just like, we're going for a drive. And this was the very first time that he he prostituted her. And it was with five guys. So she was like, you're crazy. Like, you're not going to shoot me in front of five witnesses. And he literally told her, like, These are influential businessmen with wives and families. Do you think they're going to care what happens to some nickel and dime hooker? Like, do you think they're going to admit to being here waiting for a prostitute? So she's just like, Chuck, like, don't do this. And he's like, say your prayers, you know, take your clothes off or you're one fucking dead chick. Wow. So she took her clothes off. Um, Before she went out to the room with the guys, Chuck said, Stop your crying before you go. Stop your crying before you go out there. Crying is very bad for business. <laughs> Isn't that horrifying? Yeah, that's insane. Okay, so I'm gonna give a quick trigger warning here because this is where it's gonna get um, a lot more graphic again. And um, it's I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> 
So the men are looking her over. She's naked. One of them went up to her and bounced her breasts in his hand and said, Looky here, they bounce. Suddenly, she remembered the barmaid who was hooking up with the three men at once, and a tear rolled down her cheek. One guy was like, what the fuck is up with this chick? But Chuck was like, she'll be fine. Oh. The men basically, like, grabbed her arm and led her to a bed, and they took turns penetrating her, putting their things in her mouth. They treated her like a blow-up doll. They picked up her body and moved her. She describes it as if they were playing musical chairs with her body parts. Somebody said, let's make a sandwich. And she didn't know what this meant. Oh, God. One guy laid on his back and the others picked Linda up and placed her on top of him and guided his thing inside of her. And then a second guy climbed on her back and started penetrating her anally. Linda had never experienced anal sex and it tore her up. She whimpered, and somebody said, Oh, looky here, we must have a new baby here. Ew. I know, I need to take breath. (laughs) Three of them were constantly shoving their things into her face and into her body, and two of them were seemingly bothered by the fact that Linda was scared and in pain. Two of five. Two out of five. No, yeah, there's five of them. So three of them were just, like, not stopping. One of them was, like, kind of talking to Chuck in the corner, like, what the fuck is wrong with her? Like, you know, right. like, why, like, why is she, like, not doing anything? Why is she not a freak, you know? And the the fifth guy was just kind of, like, like, bothered that she was in pain. But the other guys actually, like, teased him, and they were like, oh, he's in love, you know? And at one point, like, he eventually did, like, start fucking her and, like, joining in. Like, she's not even a fucking person. Right, exactly. So, That's they all so five, all five of them did rape her. You know, the rest right. two of them were a little hesitant. But the fact that they can just sit there and, like, talk about her the and, like, they, use her, they like, she's her not... her body and place it on, like, yeah. the same sandwich. Like, she's literally pickles that they just, like, pick like up doll. and put on her. Yeah, you know what like, I mean? Yeah, yeah, they literally picked her up and just, like, she's never done any of this before, you know? They just, they literally took her like an object to... And not too long ago, she didn't even know that men went down on women, and here she, she is. She didn't like, know any of this was a thing. She never, like, she didn't even know people had sex in front of each other, much less five people at a time. And of the five of them, like, even the ones that were hesitant, they didn't even, like, stop altogether. They might just back up from time to time. And a couple of them would just, like, work themselves up just enough to ejaculating, and then they would shoot their load all over her body and, like, start rubbing it in. Ew. <laughs> Can you imagine for her, you know, like, not even knowing, you know? So Linda was terrified, and Chuck was standing in a corner watching. And then somebody said, hey, let's try to get two in at once. (gasps) And that's when Linda went numb. Eventually, the guys got tired. Um, Chuck went over to Linda and said, you're a fucking mess. Go take a shower. Oh, my God. I am in shock. I know. Um... So Linda got in the shower, she scrubbed herself really hard with hot water, and she prayed and prayed and asked God why this was happening to her. When she got out of the shower, the men were gone. Chuck was counting money on the bed. The men were each charged $40, but one guy demanded a refund because of Linda's, quote, attitude, and Chuck had to give him half of his money back. Oh, I'm sorry, she reacted to five men raping her, and you're upset about it. That she didn't even know oh, what was going to happen until it happened. That's insane. Yeah. So, um, they got back in the car and Chuck started beating her. He said, don't you know how to do anything right? You were lying there like some vegetable, like some fucking turnip. You're no good and you never will be. You don't know what to do and you don't know how to do it. What the fuck is it with you anyway? You better start getting your shit together, Linda. Uh, well, I don't like it. And she did not, she didn't dare say anything back. Chuck continued setting her up with different men. The next client wasn't as brutal as the other guys. He tried to give her friendly advice and tell her to try to act like she was enjoying it, but she was just like, let's get it over with. She could tell by his expression that he wasn't into it, and then she got scared because she was like, fuck, what is Chuck going to do? Right. And he beat the shit out of her again. He... He grabbed a butcher knife and he told her that he would slice up her face and that she was so ugly that nobody wanted to fuck her. 
He would tell her that she had flat tits and ugly scars on her belly from her car accident. Aww. As the business expanded, Chuck hired more girls to work for him. And you would think that this might lighten the load on Linda, but you would be wrong. If a customer was handsome or clean cut, then one of the other girls would get it. But if the customer was like 350 pounds and a mama's boy or a sadistic creep, then Linda would get them. Oh! Linda learned that the guys who enjoyed seeing her in pain, she learned that she would cry out one moment and then act like she was in pleasure. But like, like, you know, like, like, ah, it hurts. And then being like, but don't stop. She learned that that was what they wanted. So she, these are like tips that she's picking up on like how to fool these guys into kind of coming early. Yeah. I know a few of those tricks. (laughs) But before she figured this out, one trick complained about her. Chuck offered to make it right and let him have her again for free, but the guy was like, thanks, but no thanks. Call me when you get someone new. <laughs> he didn't even want her for free. Oh, no, exactly. So oh, this led no. to more beatings, and Chuck was like, you useless cunt, I can't even give you away for free. But it was hard. So one client wanted her to sit on his face and urinate, and she just couldn't do it. Like, she said she tried, and she couldn't. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you do that until... Yeah. Well, you've never thought of that. You don't even, you know what I mean? Right? Like, why? Why? It's different if you've thought about it. You want, you know what I mean? But she didn't even, you know. Anyway, she's probably like, oh, I don't want to do this to you. <laughs> so, um, Linda and Chuck's apartment had peepholes in it so that Chuck could watch Linda with her dates. Oh. Linda was always a little bit more pleased when a trick wanted to meet her at like a motel or an apartment because Chuck couldn't watch them. And there was always like a small possibility of escape. Plus, Chuck never beat Linda in public. He only did that, like, at home, where people couldn't see it. So nobody knew how much of an asshole he actually was. No, like, everybody, yeah, like, everybody knew he was a dick, and he just kind of talked to women in this way. He talked to everybody, like, like he was to be feared. But nobody really knew it was that bad, you know? They just kind of thought he was an aggressive asshole. Or, like, he had anger issues. Right. So, um, one day Chuck drove Linda... One day, Chuck drove Linda to a home in South Miami where a man named Lenny Camp was living in an absolute squalor. He led them to his bedroom where floodlights had been set up around the bed and pointing down at it, and he told Chuck, get her undressed now. And Chuck told Linda that it was time to undress for some pictures. She was hesitant, but she knew better than to disobey. It's funny because in the past, like, probably when they were still getting along, he told her, like, don't ever let anybody photograph you because, like, that, you know... You're setting yourself up for, like, sabotage. And he, she even said that to him. Like, you told me never to do it. And he was like, shut the fuck up. I didn't mean me. Right. You know? Like, now it doesn't matter. Yeah. It only applies to other people, not myself. Right. So she was hesitant, but she knew not to disobey. He told her to go to the bathroom and put some makeup on. And in the bathroom, she met a girl named Chicklet, who was also modeling for pictures. So as she's talking to Chicklet, this is how she figures out that she's actually supposed to have a sex scene with Chicklet. And Linda had never been with a woman before. So as she was talking to her, she started crying. And Chicklet was really sweet and tried to comfort her. She told her, these are just pictures. They're not movies. We don't have to really do it. Just go through the motions and fake enjoyment and relax between takes. And she was also like, look, you don't, you don't think I'm ugly, right? Like, it's not that horrific. Like, <laughs> we're just taking pictures, right? And, like, Linda kind of, you know, it did, like, help a little bit. And they started taking pictures, and they started kissing, and Linda kind of went numb again. And, like, Chicklet, well, like, went to put her tongue in, and, like, Linda just, like, would freeze. And before long, the guys started telling Linda things like, put your hand on her breast. And at least try to make it look natural, and, like, things like that. And then Chicklet pulled her aside for a moment and was like, look, the easiest way is to just get into it and get it over with. Otherwise, we're going to be doing this all day long, and we still have to do the 69 shots. Oh. Uh. So Linda freaked the fuck out, and she was like, listen, it has to happen. Like, it's going to happen. We have to get it over with. So when you go down on me, you can fake it. You don't have to do anything, and I won't tell anybody. After that, the guys tossed them a strap on. Oh, God. Chicklet strapped it on, got on top of Linda, and without any warning, just put it inside of her and then the big guy the camera guy uh he got up really close to them and started photographing them as always chuck was standing in the corner of the room watching 
And once he saw how uncomfortable it made Linda to hook up with another woman, it like it was like a light bulb moment, and he made sure to continue making her do it. Like even after this. Oh yeah. He, oh okay. He, that's the thing. It's just like when he was making her hook up with three hundred pound, three three hundred and fifty pound men, or like really sadistic men. Now it was like, oh, the next way to torture you is to make you hook up with women. So he was just looking for the worst thing. That was what he got off on, was her reaction and her being scared and in pain. So during this time that he's making her a prostitute, um, is he also still raping her? He actually didn't rape her often. It's like she said, he could never get fully aroused. Like, he right. has impotence problems. But I mean, I was just wondering, being that he's, like, basically getting, like, spank bank material. You know what I mean? Like, I Yeah, yeah, um... He would rape her, like, in the fits of rage, you know what I mean? But he did have this impotence problem where, like, it was like he really had to, like, afflict pain. So he had a lot more sex with other women who were a lot freakier. He would rape right. in front of Linda and stuff. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> but anyway, um, Chuck started setting Linda up on jobs with another girl named Melody. And Melody caught on to the fact that Chuck was abusing her. And she didn't like it. So she would often cover for Linda or, like, request Linda as a partner so that she could give her, like, easy tasks. And then she would tell Linda what to tell Chuck for him to, like, get his rocks off. She became Linda's only friend. But then Melody started getting feelings for Linda, and she started saying things like, I really like that today. I just can't help myself when I'm with you. And Linda was like, please don't tell me that. (laughs) She's like, please. She's like, please, you're my only friend. Like, please don't tell me that. But Melody said she was falling in love with her, and she told Linda that when she gets away from Chuck, she can go live with her, and that she would take care of her. And Linda told her that she wasn't into women, but Melody was like, you could change your mind. Yeah, because that's how So Linda's literally like, like, I can't even make a friend who doesn't... She's like, Jesus Christ, why does does everyone like me? me. You know, yeah, but not just that. It wasn't just like, they want to fucking change me and, like, force me to do things I don't want to do, you know? Yeah. Um... And then Linda had a client who asked her to pretend to be his lover and to pretend that they were madly in love. And he was actually really sweet and romantic. And eventually, he also realized what Chuck was doing to her, and it really upset him. So he tried to convince Linda to run off with him and hide out in a cabin that he owned, and then that they could become real lovers. And Linda considered it for a minute, but then it occurred to her that this might not be so safe either. Because, like, what kind of guy rents women for $45 to pretend to be... Their, his they're his girlfriend. Yeah. So at the end of the day, she was really too afraid of Chuck to escape. Because that was another thing. The guy was like, well, you can't tell Chuck who you're going with, you know? So it's like, oh, so he's just going to kill us both. Right. <laughs> exactly. And there were a couple of occasions where she tried to escape, but she always got caught. There was one time where she, like, told the trick, like, you have to help me get out of here. I'm a prisoner. Like, he's holding me hostage and forcing me to do this. And they would be like, you need to get out of here. Like, we cannot have the cops coming here. Yeah, so, like, nobody would help her. Hmm. And, like, also, if any of the other girls working for Chuck caught on, they would also tell on her. That, like, so she would be, like, brutally punished. So it's like she was stuck in the situation that everybody was against her. Exactly. She didn't have anybody. Um, And Chuck would beat her until she blacked out. And there was one time that, like, after she tried to escape, she didn't know what he did to her, but... Like, she woke up the next day unable to walk. Chuck got more and more sadistic with her. He really enjoyed seeing her in pain, so he did whatever he could to make her scream. Like, he started penetrating her with his fist, or he would use a double-sided dildo on her, like, each end on her. Oh. At the same time. Very flexible. Yeah. I didn't know they could do that. I didn't I'm either, <laughs> but I don't want to get all graphic about um what they did. He also did this thing to her with... Uh, Here's another trigger warning. Um, he would put a hose into her anus and, like, turn the water up all the way. Oh, my God. He, he was, like, really sick. Did he do that because he wanted her to perform that but didn't want... No, I think he was impotent and was, like, trying to discover new ways to get himself excited. Like, I think he was running out of ways. So he would come up with creative ways to see her, like, squirm and, like... Oh, my Really, God. like... Yeah. Eventually, Linda figured out how to relax her muscles, and, like, she she figured out what her pain threshold were, was. So she would, like, use the techniques that she learned for deep throating on the rest of her muscles to try to kind of, like, numb the pain. And uh, she also learned to kind of start whimpering before it really started hurting, you know, just like yeah. I know we were talking about, to help them the guys get off earlier without yeah. them knowing. 
Um, and and also to protect herself. Like if Exactly. That's a good point. That is going to be important. So she relaxed enough that these things didn't hurt as much, but she didn't let him know that. Over time, Linda became really well known for her deep throating. Um, a lot of men started talking about how they would had how they had never had anybody do that to them before, and they would tell all their buddies about it, and that made Chuck really happy. Like within the prostitutes, the not the prostitutes, the clients that were paying for prostitutes, like everybody was talking about this thing that Linda did. Oh, so it's like his trophy. Exactly, it's like a it's word of mouth. It's literally word of mouth for his business. You know what I mean? He has a product that nobody else has. Yeah. So, um, one day Chuck is going through the, the charges for the pot and he was discussing it with his lawyer and his lawyer was like, Linda knows too much. You have to marry her. Uh, by the way, this lawyer, his name was Philip Mandina and he was not trying to help Linda. According to Linda, Chuck could, Chuck couldn't pay his legal fees. So he let Philip have sex with Linda whenever he wanted. And he also... He basically gave Philip the right to take over Linda's lawsuit for her car accident. Philip was able to get her a settlement of like $40,000 or so, but she never saw any of that money. So Chuck took control of all of the finances and Philip basically made all the money from the settlement. It was like between Chuck and Philip. Where do these people find each other? It's like, I just, so many people are okay with. Well, and that's, that's the interesting thing about Chuck. To her, it's probably like, this is a normal guy. And then it's like, oh, this is a bar owner. Oh, he works in photographs, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse every time. Right, year. and then he <laughs> finds a lawyer. That and then there's the five guys who are going to rape her all of a sudden. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, with families. What? That's like that's such a good way to put it. It's like this is like she the way she puts it is there's a lot of Chuck trainers and there's a little bit of Chuck trainer and a lot of people. Like you just you don't know it up front because it's a, it looks like a normal sweet person who's your friend at first. Yeah, behind closed doors. So Chuck and Linda also started hanging out with Philip and his wife. And the four of them started kind of playing sexual games with their wives and, like, trade them off. They would trade them off and, like, have contests to see who could make who finish first. Oh. Linda always tried to refuse marrying him, but Chuck beat her up again and choked her until she fell. And he kicked her until she thought she was going to die. And then the next day, they were married. Chuck didn't change at all after this. He still treated Linda like shit. And he, he played these little games, like, for his own amusement where, like, while driving, he would make her lift up, lift up her top and, like, show her breasts to other drivers because he liked to see their reactions. Or he would, like, make her wear a skirt and no underwear and, like, sit in a diner with her legs open and just, like, make, like, for people to walk by and, like, see their reactions. So it was, he's he, the guy in the park flashing people. He's really for their... weird. And he also did this one thing, like, oh, God, he would, like, do you know the candy, the hot tamales? He would, like, make her put them in her vagina. Yeah. Oh my like, god. He was really weird, you know? Like I like I'm saying, he was trying to like get creative in this sadistic way. Oh so, my god. Um he also told Linda that now that they were married, not only could they not be forced to testify against each other, but he also told her that a wife cannot turn her husband into the police. Like in other words, they would not help her. And she believed him. She always accepted what he said as the final word on the matter. But in all reality, every time the police were involved, it kind of proved to be true. Like, they would basically say, we can't get involved in domestic affairs. Right. And that's kind of of the time. Exactly. They'd be like, he'd be like, oh, it's fine. It's, it's, I'm her husband. It'd be, they'd be like, all right, make sure you get her home, you know? Yeah, you hysterical woman, you. <laughs> With the whole trial, Linda had all her hopes on Chuck being found guilty so that he could go to jail and leave her the fuck alone. But unfortunately, he was somehow able to convince the jury that he was innocent. Oh, so he didn't even get any time? No, he literally told her. having a fail of her. Her, like, He was like, yeah, no, there were some kids nearby, and uh, I didn't want them to play with the weed, so I picked it up. What a good scenario. No, and, but that is, that is like, a further testament to how convincing he was. He really was persuasive and a charmer, you know, no matter how fucking, like, stupid his story was. So he... Just to backtrack a little bit, so he found this weed, quote, ear. I don't think he found it. I think he knew who was dropping it off. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. But, but that's what I said. How long did he have it? Oh, oh, hold on. That's not the whole story. He, um, supposedly he was with some skydiving friends, and they were looking for, like, an open field to land. So that, they were just wandering in this field, like, huh, oh, this is a good place, and then there happened to be a bale of marijuana there. You ever just trip over a bale of marijuana? Yeah. He, he, the dude's not even a skydiver. He's never been skydiving in his life, and, like, nobody, nobody looked, looked at this, you know? 
He's like, yeah, uh, this. I, I was looking for a good landing place. <laughs> so did he? Did he like pick it up and then get pulled over, or how did that work? I don't. I don't know exactly, but from what it sounds like, I, well, I don't know if this is from what I read or I'm just picturing it this way. I picture him like walking in a field. Like I, I don't. He was carrying it. Yeah, I'm just seeing with it. You know. He's like, I thought this was for rabbits. I don't know. <laughs> So the jury found him innocent, and Linda felt absolutely hopeless. And then one day, for some reason, Chuck agreed to have a day at the beach with Linda's sister, Jean. Like, all of them together. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, and Jean must have picked up on bad vibes or something, because, like, literally just a few minutes after they got to the beach, she started insisting that she had to go home to, to their parents' house. And Chuck was pissed, but he took her. When they got there, Linda managed to rush into her parents' house behind Jean and shut the door behind her. And that left Chuck outside, and he started beating on the door, yelling at her, you can't leave me, you're my wife. Her dad was there like, what's going on? And he was, she was like, I'm not going back. Like, it, it was this whole scene, you know, where he basically just, like, banged on the door and banged on the door. And then he spent days trying to call her. And um, basically, she told her sister Jean everything about how he threatened her, and he made her do sexual things, things with women and things she found degrading, and how she couldn't escape. Linda was really scared, but she had no real plan going forward, and Chuck was blowing up their phone. After a day or so at her parents' house, Linda's mom, Dorothy, told her, Chuck's been calling all day. I've been talking to him. He really loves you. Oh, God. And Linda was like, Mom, he's beaten me bloody. He's held a gun to my head and forced me to have sex with women and men, and he's turning me into a prostitute. He threatened to kill me. And not only that, but at this point, Chuck had been talking about making Linda have sex with animals. But Dorothy just went on and on. Linda, he's your husband. He told me everything. And I'll tell you something else. Chuck happens to be on his way over here right this minute. <gasps> oh, my goodness. What year is this? Uh, 1970. Uh, Hold on. 1969. I am so glad that in today's day and age, we are out of the, but he's your husband, dear. You have to please Oh, him. fuck a husband. I, I know I just got married, but, uh. <laughs> fuck a husband. <laughs> no, this would, my husband, this would not be my husband. Right. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> fuck oh, a she, husband. Oh, she didn't consent to this marriage either, you know what I mean? Right, so she was beaten into it. Come on, he's not, you know? He's not my, I did not choose him as my husband, you know? Yeah. So, uh. <laughs> he loves you, honey. And I'm quite frankly sick of having you here. I know, I know this bitch, you know? <laughs> She's like, don't make me beat you with a broom. So anyway, Linda was like, I need to get out of here. And Dorothy was like, Linda, he says he's sorry and he doesn't know what came over him. The whole time like, you've been together. So Weird. All of a sudden the doorbell rang and there was Chuck. And Dorothy was like, I'm going to leave you two alone to talk things out. Nope. Brilliant, right? So they're in the living room and, um, Linda's sister, Jean, had a son, and he came into the room with his toy trucks, and Chuck kind of showed Linda that he had, like, a bulge in his pocket. It was a gun, and he whispered to her, I'm going to shoot this little boy in his fucking head if you don't get up and come along with me. And then he went on to tell her that he wasn't afraid to kill any one of them. He just, he'll go ahead and kill her mom and her dad and her sister and all, all of them. So she left with him. Oh, that's horrible. As they were walking out, Dorothy said... See, Linda, I knew you two kids could work things out. Fuck you, Dorothy. I, you just want to beat her with a broom. Right? I want to beat her with a broom. A big push broom. A <laughs> 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 broom. <laughs> the street sweeper. <laughs> Shortly after going back to Chuck, they were invited to hang out with Philip and his wife, Barbara, again. Um, they decided to have this little contest to see who was a better hypnotist out of Chuck or Philip. Philip hypnotized Barbara and told her that she was to wake up feeling very thirsty, like she was in the middle of the desert. And when she woke up, she was incredibly thirsty. She ran to the bathroom for a drink of water. And then she said to him, oh, Philip, you did it to me again. Mm. And then Chuck hypnotized Linda. He told Linda, when you wake up, you're going to get undressed and you're going to get turned on when you look at Barbara. And then you're going to undress Barbara, and you're going to make love to her. All she'll have to do is touch you, and you'll come. And Barbara is Philip's wife. Mm -hmm. And she's all the while, like, consenting. Barbara is? Yeah. When Linda came out of the hypnosis, she was in a cold sweat, and she was powerless to resist Chuck's instructions. She was also terrified not to do as he said. 
as she was doing it, she became more and more scared. Like, she really never knew how far her body was going to let her go. You know, like, she she was terrified of what she knew she was going to do, and she didn't know if her body was or wasn't going to obey. You know? Right. So she's, like, obeying, but she's, like, shaking and sweating. She knew that she was supposed to put her arms around Barbara and start making love to her, but she wasn't able to. She wasn't able to go that far. What's scary, though, is that Chuck hypnotized Linda a lot, and she would actually lose entire days or groups of days from her memory. And as you can probably imagine, there were things that were so horrific that she remembers doing while hypnotized. Can you, like, she was afraid to find out the days that she can't remember. Right. She probably was so traumatized that her body, like, blocked out the memory. Yeah, and it speaks levels to a lot of things, a lot of things people have witnessed her doing and, like, things they might have photographed or videoed her doing, and she might not even have any knowledge of them, you know? That's so sad. Like, not only not consent, but to find out after the fact, you know, that you you did it. Right. You did something you would never do. And everyone knows about it. Yeah. Not only that, but people are jacking off to it, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, Linda started smoking a lot of pot and abusing Percodan to become numb. Um, so, another trigger warning. This is going to get into the, um, the bestiality. Yeah, I think this whole podcast is a The whole thing is a trigger warning, but I just I want to say, because there's some things that I think people want to know about the big story, and there's others like that are going to be really detailed, and I, right. I just feel like we need to tell the details to learn the full story. Because uh, it's really easy to cast judgment on this, you know. But this <laughs> this trigger warning is specifically about animals. So one day, Chuck and Linda got into a car for a road trip. He just told her, like, hey, we're going somewhere. And, of course, Linda was always kind of pleased for a road trip because, I mean, she would have to play these stupid games like flashing people, but she wouldn't get hit. Chuck told her that they were going to Juarez in Mexico. Um, he didn't tell her anything except that they were going to Juarez and saying, like, oh, I can't wait. Like, only an hour left to Juarez and shit like that. And then once he started getting closer, he started saying, I hope you like donkeys. Mm. And Linda would be like, I mean, donkeys are okay. And he literally was like, what the fuck do you mean? Nobody fucking likes donkeys. I'm taking you to Juarez to fuck them. Oh no, my like, God. He was waiting for a bad reaction. Yeah, he just wanted to get that shock value. Yeah. So he told her that they're going to Mexico where people are going to pay to watch a donkey fuck her. And he also told her that these men were going to be placing bets on how many inches of donkey a woman could take. He also told her that they were medics on site in case a woman hemorrhaged. Yeah, because these don't usually end well. So if uh-huh. I, mean- <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, I know there's women that can't take men, you know? Right, exactly. So... Linda never could tell when Chuck was telling the truth. So she was she was just, like, scared. And he just loaded her into the car and took her to Juarez. And the whole time she's just, like, praying and praying that something stops them from making it. And out of the blue, Chuck's Volkswagen was hit by a drunk driver. And their car was messed up. And nobody was injured. But the car was totaled and they couldn't leave. They so couldn't then, go to Mexico. Yeah, I think this happened in, like, Kansas City or something. Like, they had traveled quite a bit, but they were not anywhere near enough. So they basically were like, okay, let's start over, new plan, new life. They went to live in Jersey City in New Jersey, and they were looking for work in New York. Chuck tried to get Linda work as a stripper, but she was pretty bad. Um, I mean, at the same time, I think you have to feel kind of sexy to look sexy, and that just, I can imagine it's hard for her to know how to feel like that when she never got a chance Right, and he's always degrading her and talking about her appearance and her scars and things. Even when people talk about her as, like, a porn star, it's like, look how good she is at sucking dick, you know? It's not like, look at look at her, how she moves or, like, anything like that, you know? Right. Nobody really talked about her that way. It's unfortunate, you know? And, like, she was taking it slow, and, and then all of a sudden she has to, like, fast forward into, like, a Pam Anderson type, you know? Like, somebody who's supposed to be fucking sexy all the time. Right. Um, a porn star. Yeah, a porn star. You're right. I mean, Pam Anderson wasn't a thing then. <laughs> right. But you know what I mean, like a Marilyn Monroe, you know? Yeah. So at this point, they're not super well known. Like, At this point, they haven't done anything well known yet. So, But we're about to get into this. 
she wasn't being, she wasn't doing well as a stripper and like nobody would hire her. So he started getting his employees together and started up the prostitution business again and also branching out to use the woman to make the eight millimeter films. Like I said, with Linda, it was hard for her to even do the photographs, but now to actually have to be doing them, like she couldn't fake it anymore now that it was being recorded. And as you can imagine, Chuck was like, crying is bad for business. Like, you better fucking smile and enjoy it, you know? Right. Act like a freak. Linda was continuously forced to do things that were more and more difficult and degrading and things she could have never imagined that people actually did. And like... I'm not king shaming, but again, this is something that Linda didn't actually consent to. But she started being forced to do things like urinating on scene partners or to be urinated on. And then Chuck told Linda that they were going to make a movie of Linda with a dog. Mm. And Linda didn't want to. I mean, she more than didn't want to. She refused. She couldn't even think about it. But not only did Chuck threaten to kill her, but the other guys working on the film, including the owner of the dog, They were like sitting at a table and they had placed the gun in front of them on the desk that was clearly intended for Linda. So it was like unspoken, but it was understood that Linda was going to participate and all these men were behind this gun. Like, yeah, you're going to do this. Oh, God. Linda was absolutely revolted. She, this dog had been trained to do this. Like the owner of the dog had actually said like, oh yeah, this dog's great. He just did it with my wife for hours last night. So this dog, I mean, he was basically led to Linda, and it happened. And Linda was, like, dissociating. She had trouble, like, believing it was actually happening. Yeah, because that is such an unreal situation. Absolutely unreal. For years, she denied ever having done anything with an animal, but eventually those tapes got out. And I think that's one of the reasons she wrote her memoir, was to explain herself particularly after this was revealed. Yeah, because it's one thing to be known as a porn star, but then... Exactly. You know. Even things like urinating, it's like, okay. But now doing it with a dog, that's like taking away consent, and that's it's just crossing a whole different line, you know? Yeah, because yeah, it's, I mean, it's, ba- right. it's rape on both it ends. Absolutely. Like, anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> no words. This film was called Dogorama, by the way, and it's interesting. I was looking at um, IMDb at this film, and there were comments saying how Linda was sick for doing this film and how it was, like, clear when you watch it that she enjoyed herself and that she was pulling the dog towards her. And I think that, you know, what they're saying is plausible. But again, she had to look like she was enjoying it. And it was also an effective way to keep the dog from participating. See, um, I hate that I know this. <laughs> but from, from, what I've, from what I've learned about this... A dog has to be trained and led to do this this kind of action with a person. Like a male dog with a female dog would expect the dog, the female dog, to stand still when he does this thing. So as a person being the recipient, um, having sex between dogs and humans are I know, different. But it's like the human has to act like a dog. You know what I mean? Right. right. The dog wouldn't be backing its ass up into another dog. Right. So basically, Linda learned this from another sex worker who actually had experience working with animals. And she told Linda, like, if you want the dog not to participate, like, keep backing up into it and pulling it towards you. Right. So that, I mean, I guess that could justify why she looks like she's enjoying it. And she says that this was super effective for Chuck thinking that she was, you know, trying her best. Right. Trying her best to get this dog. Because she's started. trying to get into it. But in reality, she's trying to turn the dog off. Yeah, so that she doesn't know that, you know? She doesn't yeah. like, well, that's how you make a porn. Yeah. yeah. Up, you know? <laughs> so eventually, Chuck gave up on the whole thing with the dog. But because it, like, traumatized her so badly, he started taunting her and telling her, like, oh, we got to go get a dog. We got to get ourselves a dog. And eventually he did. He got them a dog named Rufus, and he did kind of try he like hinted at them doing it again with Rufus and training Rufus so she ended up making the video Mm -hmm. the movie with the dog and then yeah Dogorama I think it came out in 1969 and is this still a movie available for purchase I I don't even know where you'd find this shit I don't Uh, either but (laughs) I don't know how it works with BCLE I imagine that has to be like the dark web yeah Yeah, I I would imagine what the fuck would I know you know? Right. Yeah, I don't... Plus, uh, like, Deep Throat is, like, a legitimate porn, but I feel like now that it's been discovered to be... 
great. Oh, worse? Yeah, 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 great. That maybe it should be kind of banned, but I'm, you know, I'm not in that circuit, fortunately. If you know, you know, reach out to me. <laughs> Let us know. Let us know. Um, I'll put you on the show if you want. So, um, with these eight millimeter films that she was that she was making, she was discovered by a director named Gerard da- uh, Gerard Damiano. He would be one of the directors of Deep Throat and also the movie The Devil and Miss Jones. Gerard was very intrigued with Linda's oral sex techniques, which was not uncommon, and he was inspired to create the movie Deep Throat. Deep Throat is about... So Deep Throat was interesting because it was like the first real pornographic film. It was the first time that um, an ex- a sexually explicit film became mainstream. And it was like a sex comedy. It had like a storyline. It was about a woman who has never been able to have an orgasm. So she goes to a doctor who examines her and discovers that her clitoris is actually located in the back of her throat. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) So he basically tells her, like, yeah, all you got to do is, like, you know, practice this technique of (laughs) deep-throating. It's really funny. It stars uh, Linda Lovelace and a guy named Harry Reams, who went on to be, like, another really well-known porn star. The movie ends with the line, the end, and a deep throat to you all. Oh. Ho, ho, ho. (laughs) This is the first job that felt a little bit more like a real movie to Linda. Like, the sets were bigger. It was was more than one room, for example. And the actors were a little bit more established, like Harry Reams. Yeah, because it was more like a a movie than it was just straight porn. Yeah, the 8mm was literally done, like, in, in, in like, a bedroom, you know? And it was always in a house that was, like, in total squalor. And this was more like a movie set. Chuck could not stand Harry Reams. And Linda got a kick out of that. So she would kind of, like, giggle and flirt with him and just, like, act like she was enjoying herself with Harry. And that drove Chuck batshit. They would get back to their hotel and he'd be like, what the fuck was all that smiling about? And she'd be like, Chuck, you get mad. You get mad when I don't smile enough. You get mad when I smile too much. Like, what do you want from me? So Chuck got mad that she started back talking and he said something like, or no. And then Linda said something to him like, You really ought to go see a doctor, Chuck. You're crazy. And he said, you're the one who's going to need a doctor. And then he punched her and sent her flying across the room onto a bed. And the rest of the film crew, their room was just one room over. So Chuck actually picked up Linda and started throwing her against the wall that was separating the two rooms. Normally, when Chuck beat Linda, it was kind of cold and methodical, like kind of like he was training, like he was punishing her and teaching her a lesson. But this time, he went berserk. He was like a wild animal and just lost it. And Linda was screaming. Like, she knew that everybody was, like, just one room over. So she started screaming, stop, please, you're hurting me. And she tried making as much noise as she could, just, like, letting her body, like, bang on things, hoping somebody would come in and save her. And nobody did. Nobody did. (sighs) Chuck ripped off her bathrobe, and she curled herself into a ball to shield herself. She learned that... This would kind of protect her stomach and her breasts, which just meant that he would start kicking her and leaving her covered in bruises, like, on her back and her legs. That's horrible. After the beating, she laid on the ground in a ball, and and after Chuck started calming down, he started, like, walking around and whistling, ap- acting all happy, like he was back in control. And then Linda said to him, Chuck, can I go to bed now? And he said, yeah, why not? The next day, she wore shorts and let everybody see the bruises on her legs. Jerry, the director, was like, what the fuck is that? And, like, he knew Chuck did it, but he was still, like, shocked that it was that bad. He was like, what brought this on? Like, is he jealous or something? And Linda was like, no, I guess I was just smiling too much. And he was like, I'm I'm not sure I follow. And she was like, yeah, you let me know when you figure it out. Wow. Later on, the sound man approached her, and he was like, Linda, we had no idea it was this bad. If there's anything any of us can do, just give us a signal. Because, like, everybody knew that he was an asshole. Yeah, but but it's like, they all heard her banging against the wall. It's like, what kind of signal do you need? Right. Yeah, exactly. You need a phone call? Um, Like, hey, sorry, I don't like it this time. That signal? (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I don't like it this time. So she's like, so yeah, it's like, well, where were you then? Like, what you now you want me to ask you for help? Right. That's crazy. Little by little, Linda kind of seeing little openings where, like, she got five seconds to go into the kitchen by herself, or she was given ten seconds to go to the bathroom. Like, every time she tried to escape, 
something went wrong. So she was really starting to try to come up with like a, like a master plan and like be more methodical about it. So she started kind of just going along with it, acting like she wasn't, um, what's the word? I think she just came to like an understanding that. Or at least she was acting like it. She was putting yeah. on that face that she was, she had given up, you know, she surrendered and she was his. She yeah. Was, she was going to consent to whatever, not consent. She was going to agree to do whatever he wanted. One day she had a little opening and she was able to call her friend Betsy and she asked Betsy to help her get away from Chuck. Betsy agreed. She was actually worried about Linda. It turned out that Betsy had seen some of Linda's films like Doggerama and she was like, Linda would never have done that. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Betsy was like that, that like, there's a lot of stuff Linda would have done, would have never done. And that's like, beyond definitely one of done. them. Yeah. <laughs> Linda was, like, really sneaky and told Betsy, like, okay, I have a trick coming up at this hotel. And Betsy and her boyfriend Don went, and they met Linda outside of the hotel, and Linda was able to sneak out and get into their car and leave with them. According to Betsy, Linda spent the next two days acting like she had been on drugs. Like, she was just, like, phased and, like, wasn't speaking clearly, and it took her a couple days before she kind of, like, got back to her old self. Huh. Do you think that he was drugging her? No. Or, well, no. she was taking, what did you say she was taking? Uh, Percodan. I don't think that was it. You know, in fact, I think I've read this about other, like, um, trauma victims who were, like, kidnapped and, like, taken hostage. It's like, it's like an exhaustion and a shock. Yeah. That it's, it's just like an adjustment, you know what I mean? Their body is just kind of powering up, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Exactly. But think about it, you know, this woman, I don't know for how long she just... Was abused. She wasn't her. She was, she... She describes it as a Linda Lovelace doll. Like, she says it's a character that Chuck created, and this is who would give the interviews and, like, say Chuck's words, you know? Right. It wasn't her. It was her playing a character. Chuck called Betsy's house over and over, day after day. Betsy would answer the phone and say she doesn't want to talk to you. He started sending letters, and he would say that there was a van parked out of Betsy's house, and in it is a person who was watching with a gun pointed at the house, and that he was not going to hesitate to blow out the brains of every single person in the house. And then when they looked out the window, they did really see two rifles pointed at the house. <gasps> oh, my. How the hell did he know she was at Betsy's? I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm... I bet it was her fucking mom. I was going to say, maybe it was her mom. It was like, check Betsy's house, you know? Betsy really, really tried to be like, you don't have to go. But, like, on the other hand, she didn't want the cops called because they had, like, drugs. They had, like, a lot of drugs, you know? So, it was but the she 70s. was like, don't go. She, like, she told them that he's going to kill you. But Linda was like, he's going to kill all of us, you know? Like, if I stay here, he would literally call, kill all of us. And that's what she was always terrified of. Of course, Chuck had to punish Linda after this. Oh, wait, so did she go back? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, Betsy, so yeah, she tried and tried to stop her, but Linda, yeah, she was like, I don't want to keep pulling other people into this, so she went back. <sighs> Oh, yeah. that's such, yeah. And Betsy tried. Like, it, it, so, it seems like it was, like, days, but... Like, there was one point where Linda actually took the phone, and Betsy was like, did he say he's going to blow up the house? Yeah, he's been saying that for a few days, you know? And Linda was like, no, he's really going to do it. Oh. Um, yeah, so Betsy didn't want to let her go, but she, you know, she didn't, like, couldn't do anything at that point. Right. She was trying to protect her. So, of course, Chuck had to punish Linda at this point. And by now, they had already done pretty much every horrific thing imaginable to her, and she was becoming numb to a lot of it. So, apart from the physical abuse and the usual mind games that he played to humiliate her, he constantly pushed the limits and found new ways to degrade her and to take away her autonomy. So she knew a punishment was coming, but she really had no idea what it was going to be. She just knew it was going to be brutal. Oh, God, I can't even imagine the anticipation to that. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break right here because the story is getting kind of long, but we will come right back and release part two of this episode. So don't go away. Say bye, Summer. Bye. Yeah, so Betsy didn't want to let her go, but she, you know, she did like, couldn't do anything at that point. Right. She was trying to protect her. So, of course, Chuck had to punish Linda at this point. 
So one day they were sitting at home and there was a knock at the front door. It was Linda's parents. Chuck told Linda, don't let them in yet. Before you open the door, take off your robe. <gasps> she was like, Chuck, those are my parents. Don't do this to me. And Chuck said, take that robe off right now or I'll fucking rip it off you. And he said this while pointing the gun to her head. So she took off her robe. And he said, and now you open that fucking door. And if you let them know that this was my idea, I'm going to shoot you all. Do you think that he would actually kill someone? I don't know. He said, he, like, bragged that he had done it before. I don't know that he would, sh like, blow up everybody at the house like that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I don't know. She was scared. I think she thought that he, he would, you know? Yeah. So, Linda walked to the door naked, and she opened it. And at first, she was able to kind of, like, hide her body behind the door until they came in. And then when they got all the way in and she shut the door... They took one look at her, and their jaws dropped. Her father turned deep red, and her mom's mouth was, like, quivering. And it was a long, awkward moment. And then Chuck grabbed her robe and threw it at her and said, Put on something decent. How could you answer the door like that? You should have something on in front of your father. Oh! Oh, what an asshole. Yeah! And then they all, like, stood there awkwardly for a minute. And then Dorothy, Linda's mom, was finally like, What did you want? You called us. What did you want? And everybody was really confused because Linda didn't call her. So apparently Linda's father got a phone call from somebody who was crying and claiming to be Linda and begging him to come help her. Linda never figured out who it was that called him. She wondered if maybe it was like one of the other working girls trying to help her. And like, oddly enough, the only person who sounds like her on the phone is Dorothy. So Chuck was like, it must have been a prank call. And that was the end of that. And the parents went home. They just dropped it. Dorothy being Philip's wife. No, Dorothy is Linda's mom. Oh. Yeah. Oh, <gasps> so you, wait. So, I, I don't know. She sometimes, like, she, she said in the book, like, I, I don't know if my mom would have called my dad just, just to come over and check on me, you know, and see what was going on, but I don't know. I don't. I think, I think that was just a coincidence. It's just, a, you know. Yeah. But. I mean, if the girl was hysterical enough on the phone. It, oh, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Chuck and Linda started hanging out with a 19-year-old mechanic named Tom, who was one of their clients. They would stop at his auto shop frequently and hang out, and Chuck would always ask Tom about his old lady, Michelle. The only thing that Linda knew about Michelle was that she was also a sex worker and that she was a big freak. Chuck was always talking about, like, oh, you should do this thing Michelle does, and Chuck could only get off if there was some kind of pain or suffering happening, as we know, so there was something about Michelle like that Linda was picking up on must have been violet you was know? she like a dominatrix basically basically she uh there was one trick they talked about where she would like take shoelaces and tie them around a guy's balls or something oh. uh, well, yeah it's fucking anyway um one day chuck took linda to a party at michelle's house a quote-unquote party <laughs> party usually meant going to a place to watch strangers do sexual things to each other but this party was actually meant as linda's punishment for running off to betsy's house another one Another this was... one. <laughs> uh, Michelle was this really witchy looking lady. She was thin and tall and really pale, and she wore all black from her throat to her feet. Tom, her, her boyfriend, the 19 year old mechanic, he was also there, and there was a couple of other nicely dressed people. Michelle addressed Linda as if she was putting on a show, like, like she was in a play or something. She told Linda, Linda, we don't want to punish you, but whatever we do, it's for your own good. We love you, Linda. We're so happy you've come back to us. It was okay. weird. Yeah, um, that's a little culty. Then she goes on, you were so cruel, Linda, to have forsaken those who love you. And then they made Linda get naked, and she got a really eerie feeling. They were, like, in candlelight, so everybody's face was dark, and it was just all really spooky. Michelle said, oh, don't be so frightened, my darling Linda. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <gasps> oh, no, I don't know if you need it or if you saw it coming, but trigger warning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is going to get really, really graphic again. Um, oh, dear God. So, yeah, like you said, she is a dominatrix. Michelle tied Linda's hands together in front of her, and then she bent her over a footrest in front of a couch so that Linda was on her knees and her backside was exposed to everyone. Then she pulled out a whip and she started whipping her. And this was just little taps at first. Like, this was the foreplay. 
So, like, Linda knew, like, I'm supposed to cry out in pain and then be in pleasure, you know? I, I know, like, to do this before I get really in pain, you know? But she knew she had to pretend. She had to put on an act. After the whipping, Michelle took out a hair dryer, and she started it on warm, and she just kind of, like, ran it over her body and heating it up. And then she turned it up to hot, and she kind of started prodding her with it. And it was just, like, little taps, kind of like she knew just long how long enough to keep it there to make them react but not to like squirm and freak out you know oh that's horrible because do you remember the old ass hair dryers that literally yes, were like a they, coil yes they were like a coil that is exactly the way to put them oh my god oh yeah and this was what 1969 1970 yeah I can't so it's straight up like stove oh, top fuck that <laughs> oh my god um so anyway she says that this was more painful than the whipping but still not unbearable by the way everybody at the party is just quietly watching even Chuck, of course. Yeah. Then Michelle tells Linda, the foreplay's coming to an end. You must prepare for the true punishment. She took out a dildo, and at first she penetrated her softly, and then she worked it into Linda's rectum. Of course, Linda had had anal sex before, but it was never consensual, and she never enjoyed it or wanted to do it. So it was kind of like, okay, let's just wait to get this over, over with. Whenever Chuck wanted to rape her or have her anally raped, she would start shrieking before the pain got too serious. And like I said, this these shrieks would be enough to make him climax and leave her alone before she was seriously hurt. But this is a woman with a dildo. The shrieks made no difference at all, like not even a little bit. Michelle didn't slow down the slightest bit. So Linda started trying to like adjust her body and find a position to like relax her muscles and just do anything she could to tolerate the pain. But then Michelle would go harder. And then Linda started screaming. Oh, God. She caught a glimpse of Chuck, and he was in a state of total excitement. He was just, like, watching Linda with, like, his jaw dropped and his eyes just, like, sparkling. And then he would look over at Michelle and just be, like, in complete admiration of her, you know? Michelle went faster and harder, and Linda panicked, thinking, like, this is it. This is too much. And she had the feeling that Michelle Michelle had slipped over the edge. And she started screaming, stop her. She's going to kill me. Michelle was clearly really excited, too. And she was now using both hands and breathing heavily and just stabbing the stildo into her. And then Linda felt blood gushing out of her right. <gasps> oh, my God. Finally, somebody spoke up. Some random guy got up and shouted, whoa, right there. What the hell are you doing to this chick? And Linda was shocked, but she was also kind of terrified that this guy was just going to be like, I'm out of here and leave. But he actually walked over to them and he grabbed Michelle's arm and he said, we're ending this right now. You fucking people are crazy. We're going to get this girl to a hospital right now. Michelle was like in a trance and she's just like breathing heavily and just like, yes, I suppose that is enough punishment. So the guy got ready to call the hospital, but Michelle was like, no, don't worry about it. I've got something to take care of this. It's nowhere near as serious as it looks. And Chuck was like, yeah, Linda loves this. She does this kind of shit all the time. Oh, my God, this poor girl. I wish you could see my face right now. I'm I know. It's like an utter shock. I, I know, you're, like, speechless. But, yeah, it's like we were saying, like, she knows her pain threshold. She knows what it's too far. And now at this point, like, it's out the window. And, and her who's got experience numbing herself, you know? So do you think that this woman was hypnotized? No. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. She was a young natrix who herself gets turned on, on, on hurting that. people but i mean well, maybe oh it was specifically because it was like a small girl maybe she had never done that before you know maybe she was used to torturing men and maybe there was she says hold on there is something she says in it that she's like oh i just wish i didn't have to be i wish i just wish that you were a man i would never give this kind of punishment to a girl but you've been so cruel like so i wonder if maybe she had never done that and she really got off on it huh i don't know but i don't think she was hypnotized i think this was her thing so yeah, uh, Michelle rubbed some kind of ointment on Linda, and she said, sometimes the punishment will hurt a little, but it hurts me just as much. We just have to be sure that you don't run away again. Chuck took Linda home and told her you had to go and bleed and ruin everything. So she didn't go to the hospital? Um, she ended up having an infection, and she ended up having to go see a doctor a few days later. The doctor advised her not to have any more anal sex, because it would really, really hurt her. And she begged him, like, do not tell my husband that, because if you tell him that it hurts me, he's going to keep doing it. But the doctor told him. Not only that, but this doctor, who's like 50-something, 
agreed to accept blowjobs for payment. Oh my god. This woman had no chance, you know? Oh my god. I am just in... Where do... We're not even done, you know? Why? There's so, so much left. <laughs> Where do these people come from? I, I don't understand. I am I sick. So anyway, Linda was given a prescription for Birkenham for the pain, and she told Chuck that Another? they were... I'm more. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if that happened already or what. Maybe like, she was what like, do you like? Maybe he was like, "You want some um, painkiller?" She's like, "You know, I like Percodan." <laughs> <laughs> I'll take some of that. But anyway, she told Chuck that they were like antibiotics for the for the uh, infection, so like he could never like try to take them away from her, and she would also hide some so that if he did take them, it was only like half of them. Uh, but she started using them to cope with the pain, you know, and ev- and everything else. Yeah. And Chuck never knew that she was on painkillers. So did she? actually become like an addict do you think i don't know um i don't know maybe it's because even in her perspective it would seem like such a minimal thing in the big picture right like maybe she was an addict but maybe in her perspective like no this was my this was a painkiller right know? this right. was my antidepressant and painkiller and everything else because that makes me wonder if like those days when she was at her friend betsy's house and she was like detoxing that's a good point maybe not though yeah who knows I bet she was still smoking weed and maybe drinking. So Chuck realized that he could pay any doctors with blowjobs. So he started, like, getting checkups with a dermatologist and an eye doctor and just, like, every doctor he could find an excuse to see. How desperate are these people? Well, he's like, well, now I, you know, I don't need money. It's basically like being rich, you know? He no longer needs money. So... One of these doctors, for some reason, had all these nurses on his staff who had really big, perky breasts. And it turns out that he was giving them silicone injections. Injection? Injections. Oh. So, I don't know if that is or was illegal. Do you know about this? No. I don't know. If but I just or... think about, like, lip injections. And... Okay. So, anyway, at this time, it was illegal. So, for Linda, all she knows is, well, if it's illegal, it's usually because that's dangerous. You know? Right. It hasn't been proven to be safe yet. But anyway, Chuck was, like, amazing, and he made Linda get the silicone injections. And Linda says that she didn't want to do this because she was told that there was a really big drawback, which was that she could never breastfeed a child. And that was, even though it wasn't, like, anywhere in her immediate plan, that was, like, a dream of hers, to have babies and nurse them. But the decision wasn't hers, so she ended up getting it done. Meanwhile, Deep Throat was getting more and more famous, and the producer started meeting with Linda and Chuck to discuss a sequel. Linda started getting calls from Playboy and the such to do magazine spreads, and people started treating Linda like royalty. Chuck finally started to realize that she was a hot commodity and started treating her slightly less than garbage. Like, he used to send her into, like, gas stations to proposition, like, the guys at the counter, and he stopped doing that. He was like, yeah, that would actually hurt her. Her, her image now. You know? Yeah, because she looks like Now a... that she's in Playboy, you know? Yeah. One day after a photo shoot, Hugh Hefner invited Chuck and Linda back to his mansion for a buffet and a movie. Actually, he invited Linda, but Chuck wasn't going to let her go anywhere without him, so he ended up getting permission to come along, too. And Chuck actually took Linda to buy a nice dress for this occasion. Hmm. He picked it out, but he spent, like, $100 on it, which was, like, wow, you know? Like, so through all this, he never, like spoiled her or anything obviously oh, he no. treated her like shit he but... would like so let me give you one example he wouldn't take her shopping but he would buy her like three or four blouses that were all see-through and then make her wear them without a bra for her interviews oh that was the extent of his spoiling her he would never they would never go to nice restaurants even for himself unless it was something like he had a meeting with hugh hefner or like he wanted to look something good quote yeah or he was invited <laughs> so yeah he's like oh shit we're going to a buffet at hugh hefner's yeah we better go shopping you know yeah. This was one time that he was like, we want to go back. <laughs> we want to look nice for this. After dinner, Hef pulled Linda aside, and he decided to talk to her about Deep Throat. And he apparently he apparently told Linda that he was more interested in that one film that she had done with the dog. Hugh Hefner? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm nodding. <laughs> I, I know. Um, I need to catch up on all of the... Uh, Inside Playboy? Yes. I do, too. We can watch that together and do an episode on that together, because it, it just seems overwhelming. Yeah, because I, I mean, knowing that he wants to watch her fuck a dog, now I'm curious what else he did. Uh, oh, so yes, uh, Hugh is like, yeah, I really like that dog film you did. <laughs> According to Linda, he said, that was terrific. You know, we've tried that several times, try to get a girl and a dog together, but it's never worked out. 
And Chuck was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's tricky. Oh, my God. Hef went on and said, yeah, I'd really like to see that. And Chuck was like, oh, really? Well, that's no sweat for Linda. Oh, yeah, she's a dog expert. I mean, she did it once. You Hefner can't get anybody to do it. Oh. Anyway, Linda says that Chuck and Hef talked about sex with animals for a couple of hours and that it was like watching a couple of kids talking about their toys on Christmas. Ew. Huh? So Chuck set it all up and they brought their dog Rufus over to Hef's mansion. It's really funny. Like she describes Rufus. how they actually flew Rufus in and got him this little like doggy boarding suite. And she's like, I bet that dog was so confused to be flying into Beverly Hills like a celebrity like that. <laughs> and then taken to Hugh Hefner's house. <laughs> right. Chuck told Linda, this time hang in there and give it time. Like we have to be patient and you know, Hugh Hefner must understand that. He must know that. So just give it time. Even if Rufus doesn't seem to want to do it, just wait it out. So Linda did exactly what Chuck told her, and she used her tricks of, like, slightly backing into Rufus to get him to back off of her. And they did this for what seemed like forever until Hef was like, you know what, forget it. These things happen. (laughs) That's Rufus, like, hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for not raping me. (laughs) Yeah, bitch. Sorry. That was Jude, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it definitely wasn't oh, Rufus. God, yeah. <laughs> Poor Rufus, man. I really hope he went to a good home. Yeah. In Beverly Hills, but not to Hugh Hefner's place. Yeah, not to Hugh Hefner. Linda's getting more and more attention now. She's getting calls for, like, interviews and stuff, and she got an offer to write a book called Inside Linda Lovelace. This was, like, a porn, po- or, or, like, a, a sex-positive autobiography. However, again... This was the Linda Lovelace doll talking. Uh, This was all Chuck. All of this attention that Linda was was getting was kind of creating a small wall between her and Chuck that was just kind of getting bigger and bigger. So, um, right. So Linda became an author. And and like I said, this whole book even sounds like it was written by a fucking man who doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like... The book, the whole book is like, I'm Linda Lovelace, and I live for sex, and I've been a chronic masturbator since age 12, and I love having sex on camera, and I lost my virginity to the amazing Chuck Trainer, and his fat, rock-like muscle tore into me like a battering ram. I've never come so fast in my life. Like, it's all bullshit, you know? <laughs> I bet like, not. Like, the entire book is, like, written by a man trying to get it into the mind of a woman. Misogynistic. Yeah. Sorry. In 1976, though, Chuck admitted in an interview... I wrote the book Inside Linda Lovelace with another guy before Linda and I split up. I created the sex situations in it just as I created Linda Lovelace. That wouldn't be known until much later. So Linda was starting to get attention from all kinds of people, even celebrities. And one day she and Chuck got a call from Sammy Davis Jr., who was apparently a huge fan of Deep Throat. He invited them over to hang out at his suite at the Waldorf Astoria, and Chuck told Linda that he expected something to happen between she and Sammy that night. But when they got there, his wife, Altavice, was there with him. They all hung out and they talked, but nothing sexual happened. Sammy continued inviting Chuck and Linda over to hang out, and he arranged the seating so that Linda was sitting next to him, and Chuck was next to Altavice. Hmm. Before long, Linda and Sammy started hooking up, But they wouldn't have just regular intercourse, because Sammy considered that to be cheating on his wife. But oral sex was okay, and that's what he wanted. He wanted Linda to deep throat him. Of course he did. Poor Linda, it's like all she's good for. (sighs) She's like, I don't even like sucking dick. Why is that all we want to do? Can you imagine when it's like, you want to be an actress, and you're starting to meet all these people that are your idols, all these actors, and they're like, oh my god, I'd love to shake your hand. Linda Lovelace, I heard you give great blowjobs, you know? Right, yeah. Can you suck my dick? Linda Lovelace! So nice to meet you. Can I you have beautiful you eyes? Yeah. <laughs> Altavise and Chuck hooked up too, and I think that was kind of the setup. But Altavise despised Chuck. She absolutely could not stand him. And she supposedly asked Sammy to find her somebody else. Ooh. To Linda, it seemed that Altavise wasn't into the orgies or the hookups as much as she as much either. And she just like participated in them to make her ha- her husband happy. But anyway, the four of them hooked up and they would switch it up. And sometimes Sammy and Chuck would make Linda and Altavise hook up for their own enjoyment. Sammy supposedly started to get pretty serious feelings about Linda. Hmm. 
one night all devise had gone out and it was just Linda, Chuck, and Sammy, and they were watching a porno movie together, and Linda was deep throating Sammy while he watched the movie. According to Linda, Sammy whispered to her, I really dig that. When are you gonna teach me how to do that? Huh? She uh, thought he was joking until he looked over at Chuck and asked if she thought he would mind. Oh. I know. That plot twist. I know. So Linda saw an opportunity here. She was like, mine? No, you go for that in a big way, but let me set it off for you. <laughs> oh, she's like, hell yeah, you can suck a stick, please. She knew that Chuck, in fact, would not go for this. In fact, he was kind of a homophobe. So she went over to him and unzipped his pants, and she was like, well, you can't just sit there. And Chuck was, like, really into the movie and I guess was just, like, just, like, leaned back and let her open his zipper and, like, didn't pay any attention. But Linda actually unzipped his pants, but then Sammy was the one to kneel down in front of him. (laughs) It took about a minute or two before Chuck realized that something was different. (laughs) So this is a quote from the book Ordeal. It says, Then, although Chuck didn't utter a sound, his eyes were screaming for help. He looked back at me, boiling mad now, and with his right hand gestured for me to come over and free him. I just shrugged my shoulders and laughed. Did he beat her for that? I don't think so. Good. I don't know. I don't think he did. I don't know if she even mentions it. But of all things. Actually, I think, she, <laughs> I think she does say something like, I know he's going to beat me, but it was worth it. You know? Yeah. I think she does say something like that. Chuck had this weird thing where he would not stand up to people in a position of power. And I guess he was too intimidated to say anything to Sammy Davis Jr. So he just let it go. He just (laughs) let it happen. And whenever Sammy showed signs of slowing down, Linda would give him more instructions and encouragement to keep going. (laughs) Ironically, she was giving him the same advice that Chuck had given her when he was teaching her how to deep throw. Oh my (laughs) God. She wrote, Chuck glared at me, but he didn't utter a word. He would put up with anything rather than risk losing the friendship of Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> He's so pathetic, right? He's like, I want to be friends with you so bad, I will let you fellatiate me. <laughs> oh my god, I'm glad he got a taste of his own medicine, though. You know, just one thing that he didn't consent to. I mean, not not that that's okay, but, you know, at least at least he kind of got a glimpse. Got a glimpse yeah, a taste medicine. of his own medicine. Yeah. Not that that's I, whatever. I, would I wish think that it's on fine. anybody, you know. But <laughs> yeah. if it has to happen to somebody, let it happen to Chuck Trainer. Not long after this, Sammy decided to actually make love to Linda, effectively choosing her over his wife. <gasps> but this also ended up being the last time that Linda hooked up with him, because not long after this, she would actually leave this life. Oh. Fortunately, finally. Linda was offered a lot of different jobs, like I said, interviews and stuff, as well as performances, including a stage act where she would sing and dance. And she was really excited about this because she loved music. And that was also one thing that Chuck never let her do. He never let her listen to it because he knew it was something that made her happy. Like, he would find the weirdest ways to just, like, crush her soul. Like, she never got to do anything that she liked. She was just, like, in a prison. And then say she would have, like, a belt with, like, fringe on it that she just, like, found beautiful. And then he would, like, cut the fringe off of it. Oh. Yeah, you know, like, he was literally breaking her heart, like, every day. So music was another thing. So when she was invited to do this this show, she was really excited. But his partying was making it harder and harder for her to get to rehearsals on time. Because he would go out until, like, 4 in the morning, and she would have to go at, like, 9 a.m. to work. And whenever she did stand up to him and, like, just being like, I'm going to lose my work, you know? Like, I need to get to this job. It's important. He started intentionally making her miss rehearsals because he realized it was important to her. At one rehearsal, he actually hit her in front of everyone, and people really threatened to leave if, if that happened again. Or, also, because she was having so many problems with, like, showing up on time or just missing rehearsals, they also threatened to leave for that. Because they were like, dude, we're investing a lot into this, like, we're gonna walk. Right. One day, um, Chuck showed up to rehearsal, and it was too early to pick her up. So Lynn actually fought back, and she said, no, you can pick me up when it's over, and that's at 4.30. And, like, they yelled at each other for a bit, but, like, she stood her ground, and this time he actually left. And this production is one where people are acting like, people were scared, you know? But Mm -hmm. Linda was, like, standing up for herself and was like, this is Linda's show, you know? Right. That day, he left, and she put her everything into that rehearsal. She put her heart and soul into it. And a backup dancer actually told her, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen you smile. 
And somebody else was like, you know what? I think this is the first time that you've actually been living. Right. You know? At the end of the rehearsal, it was just Linda and her dance coach, Joe. And she begged him to drop her off somewhere before Chuck came back. So he was scared, of course. He didn't want Chuck to find her, but she was like, please take me and like, I will we'll never speak of this again. It never happened. So she asked him to take her to the Beverly Hills Hotel and she checked in under the name Linda Hyatt. Shockingly, nobody recognized her. So she got to her room, she went in, shut the door behind her. And the whole time she worried if she was like being too trusting of, of her dance coach, Joe, who was clearly terrified of, of Chuck, you know? Right. But for now she was safe. She's got a door with a lock and like she's by herself. So she took a bath and then she called the Linda Lovelace Enterprises, which was like a little corporation that Chuck put together. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, he didn't answer. The secretary answered. Her name is Dolores. And she was like whispering, like speaking really low. And she told Linda that Chuck was going berserk, just calling every taxi company in town and all of Linda's um, co-stars, everybody she's worked, working with. And nobody claimed to have seen her. So he was just losing his shit. And all of a sudden, Chuck took the phone from her hand and screamed, where the fuck are you? Where the fuck do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Do you realize? And Linda was like, click. Bye. Chuck was losing his fucking mind. He had to postpone these meetings because he needed Linda to be there for, and they were like big money deals, but she didn't want to do them anymore. And he's like blowing up everybody's phone and like threatening to kill them and their families if they don't find her. Several people got court orders barring him from talking to them. Dolores actually proved to be a true ally. When Linda eventually told her where she was staying, Dolores convinced her to go to a different hotel because somebody was likely to recognize her at the Beverly Hills. Dolores also drew money from the company account for Linda and met up with her to give them to her and to hand her clothes and wigs and drove her to a new hotel and arranged for two bodyguards to watch over her 24 hours a day. Before long, though, Chuck got to those bodyguards, and they were intimidated, so they decided that they wanted to live, and they didn't want to help Linda anymore, or they couldn't help Linda anymore. Chuck's threats got worse and worse, but Linda knew that if she went back to Chuck, this time he would kill her, for sure. That yeah. would be her punishment. She called the police, and she told them the whole story. Chuck was now constantly looking for her with his revolver and his automatic rifle by his side. The police told her, Lady... We can't get involved in domestic affairs. Are you serious? Then she called Sammy Davis Jr., hoping that he would give her some support. And what he said to her was, well, you got to do what you got to do. In other words, you're on your own. Yeah, basically. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for everything. He's like, sorry, I really want to suck him off again. <laughs> so I can't help you. Eventually, Chuck stopped making threats and started calmly pleading with Linda, trying to fix things so that they could keep the deals coming. Linda was like, well, I want my own lawyer. And Chuck was like, absolutely fucking not. He went off saying that she is Mrs. Chuck Trainer, and the Mr. Chuck Trainer takes care of his wife. And the only reason that she would need her own lawyer for this is for a, desert, uh, is for a divorce. And he truly doesn't feel that she has enough grounds to want a divorce. Oh, no. <laughs> Not no. one thing. No, you don't think so? <laughs> he really said that. He said, I think what you're doing is bullshit. I have not given you grounds to stop loving me, and you better not fucking act like I have, because I have not. Uh, I never loved you. He me. went on this long-ass rant, and she just stayed quiet and listened the whole time. He just went on and on and on. And then she hung up on him again. <laughs> That's the best. Like, mm -hmm. mm, I, don't, I have no energy to talk to you, so... Chuck hired Lou Perry's bodyguard. Lou Perry was one of the producers in, in Deep Throat. So this bodyguard's name was Vinny. And Vinny was kind of following Chuck around and, like, helping him threaten all these people. And when Linda found out, she actually went to Lou Perry and was like, why are you letting Chuck use your bodyguard? It turns out that Chuck told him that Linda was kidnapped and was being held against her will. So he needed a bodyguard to get her back. So when Lou found out the truth, he pulled Vinny back and everything stopped. Chuck stopped threatening people, like, it all ended there. Huh. She stopped hearing from him. Which is kind of like a true testament to, like, when he started taking everybody away from her, but little by little, the more people that she met and actually, like, knew her, mm -hmm. like, more people were kind of getting on her side, listening to her story, you know? Right, yeah. Just like that, Chuck stopped bothering her, and suddenly, Linda's attorney informed her that Chuck was ready to sign divorce papers. I wonder what happened. Like, was there a conversation between them and Chuck at some point? 
I think it was all through lawyers, but uh, what happened was Chuck was now preparing to marry somebody else. This was another porn star oh, who God. he was managing, and her name was Marilyn Chambers. She was like, she was kind of like the next Linda Lovelace, like literally. That, that's exactly why that's, I said No, it that's God. basically what happened. Um, was she young too? Oh, okay, hold on. Linda did see Chuck again once in an elevator. She wasn't scared of him anymore. She found him as like this lonely, balding old man. And he said to her, just remember that I love you, and if you ever change your mind, I'll be there. No, thank you. So um, I'll get back to Chuck and Marilyn in a second. Linda became close with a guy named David Winters, who was a choreographer who was working with on that um, in that show. Mm-hmm. And then the two of them became lovers. Together, they made a movie called Linda Lovelace for President in 1976. Was it a porn movie? No, it wasn't. In fact, um, she had a really hard time finding legitimate acting work, so this was kind of like exciting for her it was supposed to be it's about like a, it's like a fictional telling of if linda lovelace was running for president and her campaign trail was like in the shape of it was like in the map of in the shape of a penis in the united states it was supposed to be like a sex comedy um so david was the co-producer of this movie and um he and linda were like in love by this point they were together and he was very like respectful of her problems he understood he was witness to everything that happened and he always did like stand up for her and help her put her foot down but during the movie linda lovelace for president there was kind of like a distance growing between them and from the very beginning linda was up front that she would not appear nude and would not do any sex scenes and he stuck up for her but eventually while on set all of a sudden somebody would be like okay linda take your clothes off time for the sex scene and she would look at david and he would just shrug so this was the beginning of the end for them. That was him letting her down, you know? I wonder why. The same thing, though, there's the money. Because um, another example would be oh. the book. She got offered the opportunity to write a book called Inside Linda Lovelace. Or no, I'm sorry. She got offered the opportunity to write a book called The Intimate Diary of Linda Lovelace. And she wanted to use this as an opportunity to get her story out and tell the truth about Chuck. Right. Unfortunately, the publishers didn't like that story. Oh. They complained that there wasn't enough sex. It wasn't like her last book inside linda lovelace yeah well i didn't fucking write it so exactly so they wanted to tell the story the readers wanted to hear rather than the one she wanted to tell david winters thought it over and he told linda that he thought that they should write a little bit of the truth at the time and then a little bit more and introduce things here and there otherwise the world just wouldn't accept it and they ultimately needed somebody to just open the book and read it so David and another publisher who was a friend, or I'm sorry, so David and the publisher who was a friend named Mel Mandel, and he had also worked with them during and, and been present during a lot of the abuse, they wrote the story that the publishers wanted. And even though it's not an exactly accurate autobiography, it does start to show Chuck as a villain, unlike the first book. And this book had a knight in shining armor in David Winters. It's like every man, it's like they start so nice and then they fucking show themselves. Right. But in order to please the publishers, they had to also include a bunch of bullshit that didn't reflect the true Linda at all. Things like, with a tremendous thrust, he put that surging, gorgeous cock inside me. A pulsating jackhammer that kept driving, 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 plowing into me, over and over. Unfortunately, it was like nobody wanted to see or hear anything about Linda unless it was Linda Lovelace, the porn star. Right. But the way these men write, man. Yeah, they're... (laughs) Like, like no okay. Woman, no woman talks like this, you know? One thing that really messes with me is that there's passages in the book where Linda sounds not just like a prude, but actually seems to be borderline shaming non traditional relationships or kind of kink shaming. And to be honest, I don't know if I could exactly blame her considering that her relationship with sex and porn might not have been so bad if it weren't always rape. And maybe she can't separate some of those kinks from rape. You know? Right. And to her, I mean, being introduced to those kinks as like basically non consenting, she probably thinks that most people that take part in that are probably not. Exactly. She she didn't meet a single decent person in all this work, you know. Even the people who fell in love with her always had, you know, their own their own uh what am I thinking? Agenda. Their, yeah, exactly. Oh, and not just that, but kind of like how we were talking about whenever she would meet a celebrity or something and they'd be like, Hey, I'm gonna shake your hand, you know. And although they were totally respectful and admired her, she couldn't help but think, now I know you watched the disgusting things I did under coercion and the threat of death. You know? Right. So it's like every single man she met, she started thinking, 
any single one of you could have a little bit of Chuck inside of you. You know? And Which everyone that she has encountered has. Even the most normal people. Even every doctor she went to. You know? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Everybody she came across was pretty much either a huge perv or really sadistic. So, so unfortunately, Chuck and men like him, who he surrounded himself with, that was all Linda knew. And it's hard to tell her that's not true, you know? Yeah. Especially because, I mean, it makes you think that everyone is just like that. Exactly. Like there's no safe place. Even, and that's the thing, David Winters would have been shining, shining armor, and then he's like, well, just take your clothes off, Linda, come on. Yeah. You know? Even though Don't she's worry. like, but this was supposed to be my last born, you know? Yeah. I thought you understood that, you know? You got me out of there. So anyway, um, Linda kept trying to become a serious actress, but it never really worked out because she wouldn't do things in the nude, and she wouldn't do sex acts. And producers would pro constantly promise her that was fine, and then they would start making changes to the script. They'd be like, eh, it's just a little topless scene, and then it's just a little softcore sex scene, and then just one or two hardcore sex scenes, you know? Like, yeah, they would just keep a little razzle-dazzle. Like, exactly. After she agreed to do the job, they would start adding and changing the script. In 1976, Linda was chosen to play the title role in the erotic movie Forever Emmanuel, which... I don't know if it was, the, this is, it was described as an erotic movie, but I don't know if it was always that way, because according to Linda, the script for the film started out very sweet and romantic and beautiful, and then again, as time went on, things were being added to it, and what started as a romance scene turned into a topless scene, and, and so on, and then Linda started being like, I'm not doing that, like I told you I wouldn't do that, and then they actually took the role away from her, and they gave it to somebody else, somebody who was willing to do those things, uh, and they gave Linda a smaller role. So yeah, according to Linda, she got a smaller role because of this. You know, she wasn't willing to do those things. According to the producer, he said, Lovelace was very much on drugs at the time. She had already signed for the part when she avowed that, quote, God had changed her life. She refused to do any nudity and even objected to a statue of Venus de Milo on set because of its exposed breasts. She was replaced by French actress Annie Bell. So it's almost like she's just traumatized and doesn't want to have to deal with anything that happens. Right, to but that's herself. why I'm so interested in, like, was it always an erotic film? Because I don't think she would have signed up for that, you know? Right. She would have signed up and be like, but I won't do any erotica, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, eventually, Linda did find a man that she would marry and have children with. She did find the one man who she trusted and could actually enjoy having sex with. In 1976, she married Larry Marciano. He was a cable installer who later owned a drywall business. He actually knew Linda from the old days, I think maybe from high school or something like that. So when he thought of Linda, he actually thought of Linda Borman, the woman he knew before she became Linda Lovelace. So Linda was exactly the kind of man she needed. He was the kind of man who firmly believed in defending his wife's honor, which turned out to be a full-time job as the, hun the husband of Linda Lovelace. Oh, I'm sure. The silicone injections in Linda's breast turned out to be really dangerous. The silicone didn't stay together. It separated and it started slipping around, and her breasts became lumpy and painful. She'd been to a couple doctors, and she was told that the disintegrating silicone could form a clot and kill her. Some of the doctors even told her that she needed to have her breasts removed immediately. But then, Linda found out that she was pregnant. And as it turns out, she was able to breastfeed her baby. Aww. So she just kind of took the risk with them. She, she kept her breast. But yeah, it worked out. Linda and Larry had two children, Dominic and Lindsay, born in 1977 and 1980. They ended up getting a divorce in 1996 after 25 years of marriage. She did kind of speak unfavorably of Larry in, since then, I believe in, in a book or an interview. But, but since then, they've said that the divorce was civil and they remained in contact until the end. In 1979, Linda did a polygraph exam, which I believe was at the suggestion of her editor for the book Ordeal. What was the polygraph for? It was just kind of to uh, solidify what they were saying, like the editor wanted to make sure it was true before publishing it. Mm -hmm. um, so during the, sec during the session, the test results supported the following allegations. That in 1971, Trainer forced Lovelace to have sex with five men for money. Anne pointed a gun at her and threatened to kill her if she refused. During her relationship with Trainer, she feared for her life if she tried to leave him. He would hypnotize her. He asked her to help him run the prostitution business, and when she refused, he hit her. He beat her the night before their wedding and during the filming of Deep Throat. After she left him, Trainer threatened to shoot her sister's son if she did not return. 
When out with other people, he would tell her not to speak, and she had to ask permission to use the toilet. And lastly, the movie Deep Throat made approximately $600 million, but Lovelace was only offered $1,200. However, she did not receive any money from the film as Chuck had kept it. Oh my god. So all of those were corroborated by the polygraph, which you know is, is not evidence, but it does say something. I think. So That's he made all of that money, but didn't give her any and also didn't spoil her or do anything. No, he didn't do anything. That's the thing. She she wasn't a person. It was like she, she didn't exist. You know what I mean? Everything was her. Like, you, all of her signatures and everything was him. That's why the last time he got so mad when all he needed, like, she didn't even need to sign anything. She just needed to be at the meeting while he signed. I'm just in awe that anyone can treat people like that. You can completely take away somebody's autonomy like that. Chuck Trainer did go on to marry Marilyn Chambers and manage her for a while. She didn't come out and say as much as Linda did. There was a Vanity Fair article where um, Trainer said that he considered himself a country boy and that he could live far away from civilization and that if his woman said something he didn't like, he thought nothing of hitting her for it. He said that? Mm -hmm. oh. He said that was just the country boy in him. Oh, oh okay. Makes um, sense. Linda's allegations have been disputed since she's voiced them, but if you look at the, the DVD of Inside Deep Throat in the second commentary, one member of the production crew actually he backed up Linda's allegations of the brutal beating that left the bruises all over her that you can actually see in Deep Throat. Um, this man said that he was in, in the motel room next to hers and he could hear him viciously beating her at night. And he's the only one out of everyone that heard it that said anything. I don't know if he's the only one, but his was not notable. Mm. I think, oh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. There are other people, and especially because they made a, a sequel, Deep Throat 2. And it was very, like, well-known. Everybody was like, nobody likes him. He's kind of aggressive. And uh, maybe even the people that didn't witness it, they'd be like, oh, I believe it. You know, I take Linda's side on this, you know? Yeah. Marilyn Chambers actually ended up divorcing Chuck Trainer as well. In 1986, Linda testified before the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography, also called the Mies Commission, stating, When you see the movie Deep Throat, you were watching me being raped. It is a crime that the movie is still showing. There was a gun to my head the entire time. In 1987, Linda had to undergo a liver transplant. She actually contracted hepati hepatitis from the blood transfusion she received after her car accident in 1970. Oh my god. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, but she didn't die. She survived that. that but was does a, that mean that everyone that she slept with has hep hepatitis? I don't think so. Or is that blood? It's blood only. Probably needles. I think it's needles. Yeah, it was something to do with the blood transfusion. I think something was, like, mislabeled or mishandled or something. She, she got, like, dirty blood or something. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, yeah I think it's only transferable through, like... Uh, and yeah, so then she needed a, a, a liver transplant in 1987. Over the years, Linda has become an advocate against pornography. She traveled the lecture circuit on a crusade against pornography and spoke at colleges and met with prominent feminists. There's a whole thing called the feminist sex wars, which is basically like one side of feminists arguing that pornography is exploitative and harmful to women, while the other side is more about sexual revolution and being empowered by sexual freedom. I think there's a fine line between the two. I think so. So interesting. This is what I think. To me, I lean towards more sexual freedom and women doing what they want and not always having to be degrading. In fact, and I mean, we see this often here in Vegas, men kind of make fools out of themselves with women sometimes. Like, they blow all their money to, to have women entertain them and sometimes humiliate them, and all the while, the woman really has all the power. Right. And I mean, same with, like, um, a lot of not to like blast my clients but <laughs> have like sugar daddies and like mm -hmm. they send them money all the time and they just like hang uh, out yeah. go to dinner have sex exactly you could think of that as demeaning to the women but you could think of that as demeaning to the oh, man you know yeah, it's really exactly. easy for me to just be pretty you know yeah it's like there's there could it just depends on the dynamic like either the man has the power um or the woman has the power over the and, and i think it all goes back to like the woman having her own autonomy like if you want to be a woman and have like a big mansion where you charge men to come and get abused, you know, and it's just you making your money and everybody's consenting, cool. But it's kind of like, I mean, here in Vegas, you're not in Vegas, but in Nevada where we have brothels. Like, um, I lived in Pahrump for a little bit, and um, I heard this from somebody who worked, who used to work as a nurse, and she had apparently done, like, the pap smears and the STD tests on the woman from the brothels. Right. And they're not, like, slaves, but if they're going to go to the doctor, they all go out as a group, like, 
in a shuttle, like a field trip. Or like, say for example, that I was just one of these sex workers who needed to go shopping or go to like a, an appointment or something. They would like give her the money and have the driver drop them off and like wait outside for her to be done and take her home. Like it, they didn't, they couldn't just like go out and leave and stuff. They had to like schedule everything and get permission. And that's so weird. And that's legal, you know, like, cause it's yeah, like you have a boss weird. and that's part of the contract and everything. But it's like, I feel like a big problem of it is when you have a man in charge, you know, like, I mean, I guess you could put it in the same way as like a woman, if you have a madam who's in charge. But I think that's the whole thing is like, yeah, you're my boss, but this is my body. Right. You know, how can somebody else be like, in charge of that? You know? Yeah. It gives me hands made still. Uh, oh my gosh. Still. Whatever. I only saw, like, the first season, but, uh, yes. Oh, my God, I love that show. It's, like, uh, I cry every time I watch it. I know, I just, I, I don't know, it's too, like, icky for me. Yeah. But, um, an- another one we have to talk about is, uh, Heidi Fleiss, who was, a. Uh, do you know who Heidi Fleiss is? She was also in, um, Celebrity Rehab. She was, a. Uh, she was a madam. Like, she, but it was, like, she was setting up all the celebrities, with hookers and it was like I'm not doing anything wrong and like I I don't know the story really well I want to learn about it you know yeah like was she a good madam you know right or was she like a sex slave I am maid or not slave a sex master slaver (laughs) slavist (laughs) slavey no that's not anyway um so here's something that Chuck Trainer said about Linda when uh he said she was better at housework and cooking than sex she was a lousy lover. When I first dated her, she was so shy, it shocked her to be seen in the nude by a man. And that last part was actually true. And this whole, this says so much more about him than it does about her. Yeah, it does. She wanted to be a Like, oh, she was such a prude. She wasn't good at it. And it's like, and yet, and yet, here you are, fucking taking all her money, you know? Yeah, exactly. On April 3rd, 2002, Linda was involved in another car accident. She suffered massive trauma and internal injuries. On April 22nd, 2002, she was taken off of life support and died in Denver, Colorado at the age of 53. Oh, my God. Her two children and her ex-husband, Larry, were there with her at the hospital when she died. Larry said, everyone might know her as something else, but we knew her as mom and as Linda. We divorced five years ago, but she was still my best friend. Oh. Chuck Trainer died at the age of 64 of a heart attack in California on July 22, 2002, just three months after Linda died. Three months to the day. That's interesting. That is really interesting. Maybe she came back to haunt him and, like, it scared the shit she out of him. She took his heart. Like, this she is mine. <laughs> she just I'm crushed it. This. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I bet. Linda's sister, Barbara, later said in an interview that she was disappointed that Chuck died before she could kill him herself. I bet the mom was like, oh, he was a good guy. I wonder, in the movie Lovelace, they show her, like, seeing Linda giving an interview, talking about it, and she's just crying, like, oh, what if I don't? And it's like, I really hope so, man. Yeah. Revel in it, bitch. <sighs> this is another, sorry, just to end things off, this is, uh, let me let me word this sentence. Word. Here's another quote from Ordeal, just to finish this off. Every now and then, I'll pick up a newspaper and see that a new X-rated movie is opening and it stars Linda Lovelace. Don't ever believe it. All that means is that they're including a scene from Deep Throat. Yeah, they do that. They're just, yeah. What? And she says that they've done that multiple times. They just, like, reuse old footage and they'll call it, like, a new movie. So, whenever you, after she gave up on porn, there were still movies that came out starring Linda Lovelace. I'm doing Air Bunnies. Can she not sue them? Like, I don't know, because she she consented to that being filmed, you know? Oh, fuck. At the time, anyway. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure she's done everything she could. You know, she keeps telling, she told the court, like, you people shouldn't be allowed to watch this. All right, so that's it for the episode. Um, like I said, if you want to watch a dramatized, dramatized, a dramatized, <laughs> dramatized, <laughs> dramatized, if you want to watch a dramatized um, version movie of this <laughs> um there's a movie called lovelace it's starting amanda seyfried and um oh what is the guy's name who plays chuck pete sarsgaard does that sound right possibly all right well he's playing chuck and uh it's, it was really freaking good of course it's fictional so um you gotta remember there's a lot of it's it's shortened it's a lot but, uh, but i thought it was really really cool to especially to see like how the kind of grooming occurs you know like the the, how the whole persuasion happened and like yeah just to kind of see it firsthand you know that it it, 
people think it's that easy, and maybe it's not. Um, or so also, like I said, my book source was Ordeal by Linda Lovelace. I will warn you, this book is, um, it has some outdated terminology and a few slurs. Remember that the story takes place in the 70s and she wrote it in late 70s. It came out in 1980. On one hand, maybe these words weren't infamously offensive back then. But on the other hand, you can also sense from her energy that her views on sex were kind of destroyed before, before she even had a chance to develop them and explore them. Like, when I said she sounded kind of sex shamey, I, I truly disagree with what she says, but it also kind of sounds like a trauma response. Um, she also uses the word, um, she uses, like, a slur for homosexual people. And the way she feels towards them kind of swings from negative to positive, and I think that speaks a lot about people in the 70s. Yeah. It's like when Chuck was homophobic and she would meet uh, a gay man, she'd be like, oh, he seems like a lovely person. But then later on, she's like, well, they made me have sex with fags. And it's like, well, maybe they weren't quote unquote fags until you were forced to do things with them. You right. Know? Like they then were they were before that. But now maybe in her head, it's just she can never see men again. She can never see gay people again. She can never see anything other than fucking normal ass missionary. Right. As normal anymore, you know. So anyway, that is the story of Linda Lovelace. I know that was like a big roller coaster, but I, I hope you enjoyed um, I know this was like a crazy story to come back from after such a long break. Yeah, well, I think it was overdue. I think it was overdue. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those that a lot of people probably don't know the name, but maybe more people should. Yeah, it's really, I think it's really important to like have people, because I didn't know about, mm -hmm. you know, I knew about Deep Throat and Deeper Throat, but I had no idea that she was being raped. And basically. that's the thing. People know of her for because she's they're like, oh yeah, she's really good at sucking dick. Like that's yeah. all people knew and nobody knew any of this. And and I think it also is really good to open up that conversation about feminism and and sex because I'm very sex positive, you know. I'm mm -hmm. very you do you and enjoy yourself, you know. But I can also see this whole I'm anti neutral. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to you, you yeah, do it. Whatever. Do you, boo? But yeah, if you don't want to then That's a great way to put it. Which, which is like I don't think she has the opportunity to feel that anymore. You know, like maybe right. she did when she was twenty before all this happened. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I was gonna say one more thing about sex positive. The 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 exploitation thing. The whole thing where like you are a product to all these men who are directing, you know, and but I mean, I have my own feelings on like actors as well, that it's like they sign on to, to, to the creative freedom of the director who can change things on the whim. And it's like, that, that's kind of abusive, you know, that's kind of taking advantage of them to just creatively change what they do like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have, there, there has to be boundaries and there has to be consent and trust. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I trust your decision-making skills. So, yeah, I'll, I agree. I'll give you creative. And I think they should be able to pull back that consent at any moment without necessarily, like, going back on their contract. Right, know? exactly. I think they should have some kind of, like, security net there. And I think that goes for anybody who works in a career with their bodies. Like, actors, athletes, you know, people who have to put their body through risks and then they're mm. con like their bosses are constantly asking more of them. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like they should be able to pull, just like a, who was it? The gymnast that just had that whole thing? Simone Biles? Is that her name? I'm not, I don't know that story, but I have heard of like, you know, young girls that are in gymnastics and things like that and their trainers push them so hard that they you know they're not eating and they're not menstruating and you know like it's just putting people through all of this physical pain it's physical and mental and it's not okay well let me see what it was that happened i think she even had like her doctor was like yeah don't do it and they were trying to get her to do it anyway oh okay so here's the thing with Simone miles she was experiencing something called the, the twisties which i guess when you're a gymnast it like it makes you lose awareness of where you are in the air while you're performing a twist. Oh. So it's like, yeah, it's like you lose like your, your peripheral or like your sense of space, you know, so it right. can be really dangerous. Um, so she was experiencing this and she was like, this isn't the first time this was happen happening. And she knew that she had to like back out and she was like getting a lot of pressure to do it anyway. And it could have been, like, really, really dangerous. And she could have landed on her head instead of her feet. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not just, oh, she might not land right. She could kill herself. You know what I mean? Right. Like, this is her. And even if it's not that. Even if she's like, what if I don't want to fucking sprain my ankle? Like, this is my career. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. sorry, I'll do it next year. You know? Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I want to talk about, there's a lot of cases like that. There's also the WWF wrestler. And, um, oh, God. 
I'll go into it later, but he fucking just, like, snapped one day and, like, murdered his wife and son before he killed uh. himself. Yeah. And then it turned out, like, way later they studied his brain and he had, like, frontal lobe damage or something because of fucking being hit in the head. And, like, like Aaron Hernandez? Is that oh, all that's, that's a whole fucking other one. See? This is, this is something we're going to talk about. Because people, we, we're not machines. You can't just, like, fucking rebuild us, you know? Right. You can't just, like, charge us and we're better, you know? Yeah. We, we can only hit our head so many times before we have frontal lobe damage. <laughs> and we kill somebody. Yeah, and then that's the thing. Like, think about, like, when they were, like, talking about him on the news. They're like, oh, he died. And they're like, they're like, oh, poor thing, he died. Wait a second. He murdered his wife and son. And they had to, like, pull it from the news. Like, oh, fuck. Oh. Yeah, because they were like, wait, what happened, you know? They're like, RIP. And they're like, oh, shit. She's a murderer. Right? Right? And then we had to find out later what happened. So, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, hopefully, you guys stick through us with that. Um, I appreciate you if you're back after my long break. Um, but I appreciate... Oh, um, uh, hold on. Let me say that again. Me? I do. I appreciate Summer. I appreciate Summer for being here. This was fun. I'll bring her back soon, um, especially for the, to talk about Playboy and stuff. So that's it, guys. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Um, as always, remember to check out brokenlimelight.com for updates and additional information on each episode. Um, I will upload photos, interviews, merch, shit like that. Um, cool shit like that. Also, you can always leave me a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or on brokenlimelight.com. Or if you'd like, send me money for beer at buymeacoffee.com slash US. And I'll use it to take summer out. Hell yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. I heard another term for mansplaining. Mansplaining. And it was... um. Correctile dysfunction? Oh, yeah, correctile dysfunction. Are we about to watch porn together? <laughs> Whoops. Just saying sorry. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Didn't so, mean to bump uh, ya. He actually knew Linda. I said that really. He actually knew Linda. <laughs> and just to go off on a little fucking rant, um, there's a lot of people who talk about, like, ever since Holly Madison started speaking out, they've said things like, oh, well, these women consented to this. And it's like, okay, so even if they consent to being a Playboy bunny and being a model 24-7 and doing these films, does that mean that they're consenting to just being abused and right. getting having sex whenever they don't feel like it? You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. And not only that, but, like, I feel like if anybody knows how unsanitary these are, it would be fucking Holly Madison, you know? <laughs> I don't even want to See, I don't even know that. anything that happened. Uh-huh. Well, this guy's having people have... Okay, so... We'll get to it. <laughs> Sorry, we'll talk about Playboy another time. <laughs>